It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... No! Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life on this Wednesday, September 29th, 2021. Hello again, everyone. I hope you're doing well on this beautiful, absolutely beautiful Wednesday afternoon here in New York City. I hope it's beautiful wherever you may be across this great world. You know, I love the vibe of the Wednesday show. The Wednesday show has a different vibe from the Monday show. I don't know why that is. I don't know how to yeah, explain it. Oh, I think I hear someone getting set on the Zoom over there. Beware. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to get deep and emotional with everyone here. And then I was so rudely interrupted by, I do believe, our first guest of the day. But anyway, uh, Mondays is different. It's intense. It's coming off the event. Of course, this past Saturday, we had the great event, UFC 266, Alex Volkanovsky. Wednesday is different. It's a bit of a look ahead. It's a bit of a reset. You know what's happened between monday and wednesday in any event a lot has happened since uh we last spoke on monday uh today we found out that the great manny pacquiao has called it a boxing career congratulations to him on one of the all-time best careers inside the squared circle so he is done probably gonna spend some time in politics in the philippines we found out that Corey sanhagen versus uh Piotr Jan is a done deal for the uh Interim bantamweight title on October 30th, UFC 267 in Abu Dhabi. Also found out some uh, gruesome news uh, and details regarding John Jones's arrest. What was it? Early, early Friday morning in Las Vegas, 5.45 a.m. Uh, the details are up on the MMAfighting.com site right now. Uh, very disturbing. Um as most of us suspected and how, you know, you know, there were rumors out there and, and, and whatnot, but you, you read the police report, very disturbing stuff. And then you see on his Instagram, I mean, you see this thing where he's like, this is going to be the best thing to ever happen to me. I'm going to turn this into a positive, like no accountability, no apology, no nothing like him working out, you know, all's good in the hood. And I'm like, again, how could something like that be the best thing to ever happen to you? Now, you can maybe use that as a lesson to turn your life around, but to say that that is going to be a potential alleged domestic violence issue based on the police report, very disturbing. How could that be the best thing to ever happen to you? L come on, let's use our words wisely here. Let's think before we put things out there. It's like, how many times? And it has nothing to do with Las Vegas. And by the way... If you look at the track record, a lot of the incidents in the past didn't happen in Las Vegas. So what don't we know about? Happened in Albuquerque a bunch. Happened in upstate New York. You know, I know the 200 thing happened in Las Vegas, but for the most part, it wasn't in Las Vegas. So what is Dana White talking about when he says we can't get him in here for a long period of time because uh, trouble seems to find him in Las Vegas? What happened that we didn't know about? Again, not all of it is our business, but... This is just disturbing stuff. And I see people calling for his release, and I see people calling for the UFC to do this and that. We know that the UFC is going to let the, the process play out. And we also know historically, and maybe I'll be wrong, they're not going to put out a statement of any kind. You know, Dana answered some questions at the press conference yesterday. And uh, historically, if you're a big-name fighter, they're not going to do anything. But maybe this will be different. We shall see. I'm not going to get here on a soapbox and say you should do this, you should do that. It's a tricky situation. It's a complex situation. Um, and if you just look at history, you know that more often than not, the person of that stature is not getting released, isn't getting cut, and isn't getting reprimanded all that much. We know this. Um, there's more to talk about, by the way, from that press conference. We're sp speaking about, you know, De La Hoya's comments regarding fighter pay. I could get into that later on in our final segment of the day, which is, uh, I don't know if anyone asked me about it, but I'm happy to weigh in because I have a few things to say about it. That will be later in the program uh, at around 3.50 or so. Uh, we'll answer some of your questions. arielhawani.substack.com is where you can leave the questions. We'll also check in with my good man, uh, GC, for your, uh, your bets for this upcoming weekend. He came up big in his debut 
last Wednesday. Let's see what he has in store. And does he throw out a little Bellator action? Does he throw out a little Cage Warriors action? Does he dare throw out a little UFC action? I'm going to guess that he does throw out some uh, UFC action. Uh, and by the way, I did a little sprinkling yesterday myself. Put a couple of coins, a couple of shekels, as they say, on the Blue Jays-Yankees game, and it was a push. I went for the under, and it ended up a push. Under 9, 7-2, bit of a disappointing affair, but uh, I'm enjoying this. Just a little bit, responsibly, just a little bit. Not really, you know, going out there and going crazy, betting the life savings, but just, you know, a little something, something. In any event, we got a lot to discuss on today's show with a lot of interesting people. So that's the back end of the show. Your questions on the nose and also um, GC's bets. As far as the guests are concerned, we're going to talk to Johnny Walker, who's headlining the UFC event this Saturday in Las Vegas against Tiago Santos. Uh, important light heavyweight fight, light heavyweight main event between two uh, Brazilians. We shall also talk to a man that I've been wanting to talk to for quite some time. His name is Morgan Charrier, the last pirate. He is fighting for the Cage Warriors interim featherweight title on Saturday as well, October 1st. And uh, he's going up against a guy named Paul Hughes. Is October 1st Saturday or is it Friday? Why do I seem uh, a little mixed up here? No, October 1st is Friday. Um, so anyway, uh, he is going up against uh, Paul Hughes on Friday. Uh, Cage Warriors doing three events all in London. London is kind of the epicenter of the MMA world uh, this weekend with the three Cage Warriors events and also the Bellator event, which I'll get to in a second. Anyway, Morgan is a huge star, has a massive social media following, very popular in France. We'll get into all of that. I think it's someone that you will love to hear from later on in the show. We'll talk to one of the greatest of all time, Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson, at 2.30. Talk about that very special uh, mixed rules Muay Thai fight against Rod Tang. Also, his first uh, knockout loss that he suffered uh, several months ago against Adriano Moraes. Uh, it has been a while since I talked to uh, Mr. Demetrius Johnson. Uh, his loss was in April, so it's been five or so months. I'm looking forward to talking to him. He's the greatest male flyweight champion of all time, and we'll also talk to the greatest female flyweight champion of all time, Valentina Shevchenko, at 2 o'clock about her big win this weekend, where she goes from here. Al Jermaine Sterling will join us at 1.30 to talk about uh, not being able to compete on October 30th. But first, let us go to the Zoom machine and talk to one half of the Bellator main event this Friday at the SSE Arena in uh, in London. He is going up against Douglas Lima, who, uh, of course, he fought several years ago in a highly entertaining bout. They meet again in what might be uh, the best fight of the entire weekend with a lot of UFC fights, the Cage Warriors fights that I mentioned. But Lima, MVP2, uh, figures to be a fascinating affair. SSE Arena in uh, Wembley, London, England. Let us go now to the Zoom machine and say hello to the always charismatic, the always fun, the always entertaining, the inimitable Michael Venom Page. What is going on here? You going to play some music for us? Oh, man, I'm mixing it up right now, man. Let's go. Just, Let's uh, hear it. I'm, I'm in my vibe. I'm in my vibe. I'm in my vibe. I'm in my vibe. You gotta join me, man. Oh, let's do it. Yeah, MVP up in this. Are you ready? Are you ready, everyone? I feel it. Oh, it's a Wednesday. We got MVP up in this. I'm feeling this, MVP. I wasn't expecting this. Look at this guy. Get down with your bad self, MVP. What do you got? Turntables there in the hotel room? Uh, yeah, man. You have to, you have to mix it up. I didn't know. Are you a DJ? I, I thought I Michael Bisping was the best uh, fighter slash Brit in MMA who also moonlights as a DJ. Are you better than DJ Mikey B? Uh, you have, come on, I'm MVP. That's right. I'm that's the right. one and only MVP. That's a silly question. <laughs> so do you actually do this on fight week to kind of calm down and think about other things? To be, yeah, to be fair, I'd say over lockdown, uh, I made a promise to myself that I was going to learn a couple of different things, new skills. One of them was DJing, and I really just took to it. Like, I, Obviously, you see how I fight in terms of the, the uh, me dancing, and so like, music is a big part of me. But being able to and learning how to manipulate music has just been that much better. I love it, man. And what kind of music? What kind of music do we uh, dabble with over uh, there? Yeah, right. Well, I say everything, but it's like garage, house, 
Afro, Afro house right now, like South African house is like, I'm loving at the moment. R&B, hip hop, drill, soca, just everything. And what's, Reggae, Bashman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's the dream? Like, do you want to play in a club? Or have you done that already? Uh, well, nah, no, I've actually been offered to actually because uh, uh, a few times and I've been offered to go on radio as well. But for now, I'm just kind of enjoying, you know, just like friends and family, just chilling vibes. Um, but maybe later on, uh, I'll, I'll bless people. Wait, does that mean I'm part of the friends and family crew? Yeah, you're come on, you got, you're on the VIP list. All right, all, all right. Thank you, thank <laughs> you. I feel good. What a what a great way to start the show. I feel alive now. This is wonderful. Um, <laughs> well, it's good to talk to you, my man, and thank you for that. Uh, I'm very excited about this fight. It feels like you're getting the love over there in London. They had you on the double decker bus. You're out and about. You're doing the face off. Does it feel like you know pandemic still going, still tough? Uh, you had those fights, you know, it's empty here and there, but this kind of feels like a bit of a return to normalcy, right? Because I understand there are going to be fans there, right? Yeah, no, everyone's it's going to be a pack house, definitely going to be a pack house. So um, I'm I'm happy about that. Um, I don't know, in my, in my last fight, if you noticed, I turned the music off mm -hmm. because there was no fans. But I walked out to no music just as a little of a statement saying I don't even want to like even entertain in that way unless they're here. And this time I got a big show on for the people. Uh, Darren Till did the same thing. I don't know if you saw that, and I thought that that was really interesting. I was going to ask you about that. It's it's his mindset. When I asked him about it, was if the fans can't be here, I don't want to have like this, uh, you know, this joyous moment with the music and the singing. You feel the same way, or felt the same way? I agree. I agree. Like um, I think both me and him live off and like feed off the crowd. You know what I mean? Uh, and yeah, I, I I needed the crowd there for other reasons. Obviously, I have to take the fight, but I wasn't gonna. Quick, like bounce any energy around the room. It was just a case of getting in there and getting the job done, which I did. You had two performances, two fights in the uh, the pandemic. Now, the one in France was the first one. There were a couple, like not a ton of fans there, but a couple, right? I mean, it was like a thousand or something like that. Yeah, I think there's a thousand people. Yeah. As as someone who kind of feeds off the crowd, did you feel flat? Did you feel like it just wasn't the same? Oh, no, it's definitely definitely wasn't the same. But to be fair, like I know I know I know how to turn up uh, in any in any scenario. You see what I mean? But the the issue at that at that time was the canvas. I was struggling to do anything that I would normally remotely do. Um, so I just couldn't be myself. I had to really adjust uh, uh, to win that fight. What do you mean? It was like slippery? Yeah, it's extremely slippery. Um, the canvas was, and I've actually spoken to them again. I think the following event that they did. I can't remember where, I believe it might have been Mohegan. Quite a few people, when I was watching them just because I had made a complaint afterwards um, and obviously they were dealing with it. But the next, the very next show that they did, uh, Linton threw a kick, uh, Phil Davis threw a kick and fell over. This, but I, I was watching from the prelims all the way up and near enough every person, threw, anytime they even decided to throw a kick, they slipped. Now with my style, the way I have to use the traction to move from left to right, forward and back, I'd constantly be slipping. So I decided to go like full Muay Thai style, almost, ah. uh, just be flat. Um, was this something that had been bothering you in Bellator for a while, or was the France event the first time it came up? Uh, the, the France event, the first time it's come up in a while. It happened years ago against uh, Nashon Burrell. Uh -huh. uh, that was the first time, and I, and I spoke to them about it, but then they they figured out what was going on, and they, and they fixed it. Uh, and then they wasn't able to use the same cage that they would normally in France, so they had to let the guys there you know, uh, set, the, set the, the canvas and so on and so forth. So they kind of explained that to me. Um, uh, obviously, because of the, the whole COVID situation, being able to bring things over made it a lot more difficult. But yeah, again, uh, I managed to figure figure things out and still and still win that one. Was it better for the Derek Anderson fight, the next fight? Way better. Okay. They, uh, they actually made actually made a point. They made sure that <laughs> I literally went in there and it, it was so much grip. It was it was perfect. Exactly what I needed. This fight, this rematch against Douglas Lima, I'm sure it's somewhat personal for you because he handed you your only loss. Um, did you ask for it, or did they come to you and say, "All right, it's time to run this back"? Oh, well, obviously, I've been asking for it for you know for two years straight. Um, yeah, of course, with the new ranking systems, it kind of makes sense. The fact that he's lost uh, his last couple of fights, obviously, the main fight being uh, the title, uh, which kind of notched him down from title holder to, to number one ranking and obviously me being number two it kind of just made made sense that we collided but i feel like it, it is the perfect moment there's such a great energy around this fight right now well you know it's interesting because you were undefeated for so long and untouchable for so long and then you lose like that 
um, and you get stopped. And a lot of people forget that you looked really good in the early portions of that fight, but it's just really, you know, the end result that people harp on. How did you handle it? That was such a foreign thing for you to not just lose a decision, but to lose, you know, via a pretty vicious knockout in the aftermath. How did you handle it? Yeah, to be fair, I, I always say to myself to put set aside five, ten minutes to be annoyed at yourself, be angry, be, be sad, be upset, whatever it is. You need to kind of get those frustrations out and then we get right back to the to the, to the grind. Um, even, even with regards to the people and the, like, how they responded, it, to be fair, I kind of expected worse because there, <laughs> there was a video uh, that 50 Cent posted a, uh, a while back and it was uh, of Anderson Silva. And because in that time he had been posting a lot about me, it was showing Anderson Silva's uh, knockout against Weidman, uh, as in him being him being knocked out. And um, I, everyone, a lot of his fans assumed it was me. So I was getting blasted mm -hmm. online, like, yeah, you deserve that and this. So I was kind of like, well, this is what it looks like. What it's going to look like if I lose. Uh, and, but to be fair, with this one, the responses were actually quite well. It was quite good. Obviously, as time goes on, as you say, people only focus on the clip. So when the clip gets reposted, then you start to get those kind of fans kind of creep back in. But yeah, to be fair, I've never, I'm, I'm, I'm numb to that from, from a, from a long time ago now. Did you feel like you needed time out? Like, you know, some people handle losses differently, right? They disappear. They don't train. They don't want anything to do with the sport. Um, they don't, you know, they, they kind of disappear from social media. H how did you handle it? What did you do? Well, so for me, uh, the thing that people haven't seen because I wasn't, you know, there wasn't, I wasn't really under the spotlight is years in kickboxing. And I even I remember probably, probably a period of about four years straight. I remember literally every competition. I was doing competitions near enough every weekend. Every competition for about four years, I, I'd get my ass handed to me. I was getting beaten up left, right, and center. And I had to keep going back to the competition because my you know my family was going back. You know the team's going back. Uh, you had to be there. You, I got used to losing. And every single person that beat me, eventually I figured a way out to get back to them beat them and then they never beat me again so it just felt the same uh again because i'm kind of used to losing like that when i took the loss it just means more to other people because of the zero but for me it's like i'm just going to get you back and this is the time for me to show that have you watched it a lot uh no yeah i've, I've, I've watched it back a few times uh and even of more of recently just to kind of analyze where the, 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 just to kind of reassure myself of the, the, the things that I, I need, needed to be careful about. And yeah, but that, that's more just for, 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 for knowledge and for, uh, for the extra, yeah, extra knowledge going into this fight. What do you need to be careful about? It's more my, my distance in that for me personally, and this is obviously going to be of just my view of the situation. I got a little bit over eager because I, I landed a shot and rocked him. And I almost saw the finishing line. I was like, yo, it's going to be over in a couple more shots. So what I did is that instead of normally just continue with my cautiousness and my distance, I decided to adjust my distance a bit closer, which obviously led to the sweep because I mistimed everything. And then again, in my eagerness to stay on top of him, I just decided to get up in the, the most stupidest fashion you could ever get up in, um, which obviously led, led to the KO. So for me, the good thing about that is the mistakes were all on me. It wasn't something that he did well. You know, it's something that he capitalized on because of my, like me being stupid in those moments. As long as I stay patient in this fight uh, and keep, keep the distance because he wasn't able to figure me out before then, like again, and then and find those shots as I normally do, he, he will be uh, on, on his back. So when someone gets KO'd for the first time, sometimes it changes them as a fighter. It changes their approach to fighting. I mean, maybe the most famous one is George St. Pierre. People said after he lost to Matt Serra, it changed his style of fighting. With you, since then, four of your last five fights have been finishes. You seem just as aggressive, just as confident. Did it change you early on? Like, did you feel like for that first fight early on, you were doubting yourself? You were you know, trying to avoid getting knocked out. You didn't want to experience that again because it looks on paper and from afar on television like it didn't affect you at all. No, to be fair, and again, I, I'm lucky and I'm fortunate enough to have had so much experience within the kickboxing world. Uh, I actually, uh, probably the worst injury I've actually got was in kickboxing. Uh, I took a, a really bad kick and had my jaw broken. Damn. Um, so I remember everybody telling me throughout that time when I was obviously in a recovery, Everyone telling me, yeah, everyone's so scared. You know, when you, when you, an injury like that, it always makes you a bit more cautious and so on. So I, it kind of it, it annoyed me during the time. 
And I made a point to myself that when I go back the, uh, from that injury, I'm going to be 10 times more aggressive than I was before the fight because I just don't like hearing what people are saying. I don't like that people are telling me that I'm going to act a certain way based on other people's, you know, past and stuff. So I'm like, no. Nah. So I, I remember literally my first fight just being so aggressive. Everyone's like, you don't look like, you, you look worse than like, way more, you know, uh, like it hasn't affected you at all. It's actually given you, like spurred you on. So I was happy to hear those things. And it's the same now. I've been, I've been knocked out in the gym before. I've been rocked in the gym before. It's not, again, it's the things that people don't see. So they can only go by and create a story from what they see, you know, the 15 minutes or the 25 minutes in the cage. But I've got a long history of being hit, being knocked down, having to get back up. And every single time I've made sure I either get the person back uh, or I'm, I'm better than I was before when I left off. And what's also interesting about this fight is you're on a five-fight winning streak. He's lost his last two. Usually the guy who lost to the guy maybe is doubting himself. He's reliving the fight. I feel like you will go into this fight with a lot more confidence than he does. When you were around him this week, what, what kind of vibe did you get from him? What kind of sense did you get from him considering where he's at in his career? Um, to be fair, I don't. I, 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 when I saw him, I didn't really want to judge him based on what I'd seen of recently. He just come off a long trip. He's feeling a bit jet lagged. He, he literally admitted on one of the shows that we were doing that he hadn't slept that night. He's weight cutting, and I know it's actually been difficult for him. He actually asked if we could do a catch weight um, earlier on in the, before the, before the fight. Uh, um, so I know there's a lot that's kind of like affecting him at the moment. So he looked very flat, and so on and so forth. But I know that's not going to be the person that turns up. So I, I'm not even paying attention to what I'm seeing of him at, at, at the moment. Uh, he asked for a catchway. What did you say? Uh, uh, yeah, I, no, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> hell no. He's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm definitely not going to make it uh, easy for him in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> well, how, how much? 175, 180? Uh, to be fair, I didn't know. Obviously, I kind of heard it through like the management okay, team gotcha. and so on and so forth. And I was just like, ah, no, I'm not doing it. Um. Not that long ago, you talked uh, about some frustrations about not getting fights, about not being active and things like that. How are you with Bellator now? Yeah, there was a lot. There's a lot that's going that was kind of going on in the background and things that I kind of was, was unhappy with. Um, we've had those conversations. Things are 10 times better. They, you can see that they're working on uh, uh, a lot. They're pushing. And even with this, the promotion for this fight, um, I, I, I kind of had mixed feelings about it. My... Seeing my face and, you know, me and Lima's fight branded around London was amazing. And obviously I had friends and family messaging me and so on and so forth. And it was great. So that was, you know, the positive side. The negative side, it was kind of like, man, this should have been happening so long ago. How many times have I been here? How many times have I put on such an, an amazing show? I'm a safe bet to put money on, basically. So it's kind of, that's the negative side. But it's great to see. It's great to see what's going on. Uh, the, the, the push that they're, they're, they're putting behind me now. Um, and I think definitely a lot of people got a lot more faith in you know my abilities and what I can do. Speaking of uh, our good friend Michael Bisping, when you were on his podcast, you talked about the UFC and whatnot, and that became huge news too. Often you don't hear people who are under contract in Bellator or another promotion talk about, yeah, eventually I want to go to the UFC. How did that sit with the brass? Did you uh, did you hear anything from them after that? Yeah, I know they they, they don't like it, but again the. The, the fact is they are the bigger brand if we're just looking at it as a, as a business and, and in terms of their promotion and you know they've got the embedded show they've got this they've got the behind the scenes like all of that kind of stuff makes for better branding um, and it's kind of stuff that they're kind of lacking over here and again I'm, I'm, I'm a massive fan of Bellator and I have been for a long time because I love the way they do the walkouts they really you can really get individual characters which I, I like I'm, I'm a big character I don't want to be you know one of many I want to stand out um, so I love, I love that side of it, the format that they've kind of created in that side, but they, they, they need to be doing a bit more, which, and it seems that they're heading in that direction. So, um, I'm definitely, uh, uh happy for them, but again, they, they, they're always not going to be happy to hear about competition, but the, the only thing you should be focused on then is being better than that competition. Right. I believe that competition should raise everyone's game, um, fighting, wrestling, everything is better when there's competition because exactly. everyone ups their game. Uh, yeah. dare I ask how, how many fights left? I, I don't even know. I can't remember. <laughs> Come on. I don't believe you, Michael. I don't believe you one bit. I genuinely remember. Come on. So, like, it's, it's all 
All right, I'm doing with that stuff. Oh, I didn't even try. I'm going to call know. Audie right now on the phone. Audie, how many fights? Oh. <laughs> hey, give him a call. <laughs> him, he might have been a plane. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll call Tim right now. I'll call Tim. Um, that's, <laughs> I have to say, though, my, like you walking, you know, it's kind of funny. Venom, Venom, they're the Venom. You walking out in the Venom outfit, like, I don't want to see that. I'm, I got to be honest. The, the, to your point, I want you to stick out. Like, you are the, 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 the quintessential example of why it is important to stick out and be different. I don't want you to look like everyone yeah. else, so I kind of like you where you are at yeah. the moment. Yeah, man. That's what I'm saying. I'm allowed to kind of really show my personality and be myself. Um, um, obviously, I haven't been over there to know, but it doesn't seem like you can show as much. You kind of have to fall in line mm. uh, with a lot of stuff. Um, but at the same time, I make noise anywhere I go. By the way, have you ever had a deal with Venom, considering your middle, your 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 nickname? Uh, they years and years and years and years ago. I'm talking when I was still in uh, kickboxing. Um, they had approached me, but all they were gonna do uh, was give me discount off um, oh, get it. Their, their, their products. I was like, yeah, hell no, <laughs> that never happened. You I know, literally still have to pay. They wouldn't even give me products for free. You know, with all this, uh, yeah, that's that's garbage. We don't need that. Um, with all this <laughs> stuff now, with Jake Paul and stuff on Showtime, MMA fighters. I was thinking maybe, you know, considering your love of boxing and your history in boxing as well, you know, you should you should land on one of those cards. Now that you're part of the Showtime family here and, and Bellator is part of Showtime and, uh, you know, Jake is part of Showtime and he's obviously using MMA fighters. Any talks of that, of you being on one of these cards? Obviously, I always see my name floating around after fights or before fights and the lead up to like his, his fights. It's, I don't care to call it out. I don't, because I, I'm still kind of, uh, 50 50 with the whole it feels like a bit of a circus circus show um so my, my my heart wouldn't be in it at all if somebody put a contract in front of me and said they're going to pay me some money uh, to go and beat this guy up then i'll do it 100 percent. but i'm I'm not going to be one of those guys that's in the background like pick me pick me yeah. pick me that's that's not my style so you know if it, if it ends up if we end up colliding for whatever reason then cool you'll see another person fall on the floor but uh, until then i don't care I was I was not even implying fight Jake Paul. I was just saying for you to have a boxing match on Showtime on one of these cards because they you know the last one had Anthony Taylor fight Tommy Fury, Tyron of course. I don't know. I just felt like that could be a good spot for you. Not even to fight Jake, just to have a pro boxing bout on a Showtime card. No, hundred percent. To be fair, obviously that that kind of stuff could line up, but you know me, I like to be the main event. That's uh, right. Okay, fair uh, enough. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, by the way, what, what do you uh, you think Tommy Fury beats Jake Paul? I, I, I don't even know anymore. After Tyron Woodley they kind of let me down, I, I genuinely don't even know anything. I don't want to make comments on it anymore. Fair enough. I don't know what's going on. In the, the world it seems to just be upside down, back to front. So the, the, for all I know, Jake Ford knocks him out. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it would be a very close fight. I wonder what the odds would be. What about uh, your fellow countryman, Anthony Joshua? Some people saying he has no mm -hmm. heart that he crapped the bed, that it was a disgrace. I feel like that's a little harsh. I mean, I feel like that's not giving Usyk enough credit. What did you make of his performance? Exactly. Usyk, uh, exactly as you say, Usyk's an, uh, an, an absolutely amazing boxer, very talented. I genuinely just think that uh, uh, Andy Joshua and his team just came out with the wrong game plan. But it seems like uh, potentially they might even be going back into the second fight with a similar game plan, which is, is, is a massive mistake. I, I, AJ is not a technical boxer. So you would never try and outbox somebody that is that good at boxing. But one thing he has on his side, uh, on his side is his size, his athleticism. He's got a world-class uppercut. If he was just pushing the fight forward, not standing still trying to outpoint him, and you know, and just make it an ugly fight, he probably would have knocked him out mm. um, because he, he only has to land one or two, and that's the difference. Usyk wasn't knocking that many people out in his own division, let alone having to move up. So. Um, but as you say, I think people are being a, a, a very harsh. But it, 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 and it was a, it was a, it was a kind of a great night of boxing. I really enjoyed the fight. Um, but hopefully, if he wants to win this fight, he, they do change tactics uh, and uh, and figure a way to actually just get to him instead of standing and try and outpoint somebody that is just is legit, just better than you at boxing. So that was a huge crowd on on Saturday. Excuse me, on Friday for your fight, uh, full capacity crowd. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Everyone's there. And you know what's great about it here in America? Sometimes in the past, or oftentimes in the past, these Bellator cards that would happen in Europe, we'd get them on tape delay. But my understanding is it's airing live on Showtime 
on Friday here in America. So I think the main card starts at 4 p.m. Eastern time here uh, in the U.S., 9 p.m. in the U.K. But for once, we get to see one of these European cards live, which, I mean, let's be honest, 2021, everything should be live in sports, if you ask me. 100%, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, especially in my shows. That's right. All right, so what's the prediction? What are you, how are you going to repay Douglas Lima for what he did two years ago? Oh, no, it's, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a bad one, but I, I don't see I don't see him getting getting out of the first round. Wow, really? It's, I'm going to be too, yeah, I'm going to be way too too intense, way too aggressive. I'm going to land way too many shots. He's either going to give up or fall over, whichever one comes first. And then title shot next. Again, as it, as it lines up, that's what it, it yeah. seems to be. But I, I don't even like to overlook my my the what's the task at hand. So until I finish this one, we'll talk afterwards. But right. until I finish this one. <laughs> I, I don't know. Appreciate the time as always, Michael. And thank you for the tunes at the beginning. A nice surprise. <laughs> Got me going. Yeah, I, man, feel, I feel good now. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, good luck on Friday. Can't wait for the fight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. All right. Take there care. he is, MVP, one of the best in the game. Uh, big fight for him on Friday. And yes, live on Showtime, my friends. These European cards in the past, tape delay. But it seems like now with the move, I lost my shoe down here. Now with the move uh, to uh, to Showtime, things have changed. And speaking of moves, I mean, what about those moves? I have cut up a lot of rugs in my day, my friends. A lot of rugs, let me tell you. I mean, they used to have to shut things down. The, the, the fire alarm would go off. We'd raise the roof, running man, lawnmower, everything. So that's on uh, on Friday. 4 p.m. Eastern Time main card prelims at 12:30. So, hey, if you do a little uh, summer Friday, even though it's not the summer, I suggest you check that out. What did this? Uh, what about this comment here from uh, my new friend? I forget her name. What is her name again? Jamie, Ju Julia, Amy, Amy. Amy, who I met last week, watching Ariel Helwani do his interviews is like watching Bob Ross paint. Wow. A master at his work and a blessing to all of us that get to watch. I mean, come on. Is that my mom? Is that my mom's burner uh, account? Amazing. Um, all right. In a matter of moments, hopefully we'll be joined by one Aljamain Sterling. He is next up on the docket. One down. A few more to go. He is the UFC bantamweight champion. And unfortunately, on Saturday, we found out that he will not be fighting at UFC 267 um, in Abu Dhabi on October 30th. He will not be defending his newly won title against Piotr Jan. Co-main event of that card, afternoon card. Main event, of course, Jan Bohovic against Glover Teixeira. Uh, the word is lingering neck issues. Put out a uh, an Instagram comment, put out a, a podcast as well, but I wanted to ask a few more questions because I think a lot of people are giving him some heat saying that he should be stripped. Um, enough is enough. My general feeling on the stripping situation is a champion deserves a year to defend his or her title. If you don't defend it within a year, all right, then the stripping is uh, is justified. But he won the belt, controversial or not, he won the belt in March, and we're September. That fight was supposed to happen in October, so we're talking five months, five and a half months. So I think he is deserving of a little more time. Plus, my understanding, and hopefully we'll find out in a second, is that uh, he was not... Uh, he was not medically cleared by the UFC doctors. And so the UFC is on board with this. It's not like he went to some, you know, Fakakta doctor and they said, hey, you know, we're not going to clear you for this. And he looked for a way out. So uh, I sympathize and uh, I actually feel bad. I mean, a neck injury, if you're not 100%, look, if you're not 100% with an ankle, then I get it. But if you're not 100% with a neck, like you should not be fighting. It's your freaking neck. That's a pretty serious thing. And so I would say, Cut Aljo a little bit of slack. This is my olive branch to Aljamain, and I would say it even if it, uh, even if he isn't on the show today, I would say the same thing. I, I wrote it yesterday as well. 
uh, I think we need to be a little sympathetic to someone dealing with a neck issue. And so without further ado, let us go back to the Zoom machine and say hello to the reigning defending UFC bantamweight champion, the funk master himself, Aljamain Sterling. Ooh, yeah, look at that. Live from the set of his show, uh, Weekly hey, Scraps. Georgia, baby. Is it, is it Weekly Scraps? That's the name, right? Weekly Scraps. There it is. It is. You got that in Georgia? Yeah, I got this from Georgia. I forgot the name of it, but um, it's from the village Swanetti. Look at that. And they call me the Swanee Man, Sterliani. I like it. Sterliani, the Swanee Man. Uh, we had your boy Marab on the show on Monday. What a win. What a performance uh, by him. He was uh, he was in there on Saturday. You were in his corner as well. Nice to see Matt back in the corner too. That was really good, right? Yeah. Does that mean uh, he's out of retirement? I, honestly, I, I have no idea. So Come on. It really on. depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends. I don't know. It depends. Maybe just the location of the fight. You know, okay. Vegas is always going to be a good time. So All I right. think that was a pretty easy decision. And uh, obviously, um, Marab is such a good dude. I'm pretty sure Marab probably asked him multiple <laughs> times and was able to convince him to come back out, you know? Yeah. Well, congratulations on the team or to the team on that victory. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. Obviously, we're not here to talk about the Marab win, although I'm sure you would uh, love to glow about that victory. What a great comeback win it was for him. We heard some uh, – and by the way, I'm, I'm going to not – you know, I'm going to promise not to swear this time. You know, last time we made a lot of news <laughs> with my F-bomb. I'm going to keep it down the middle here this time, Aljo. And I, I appreciate that back and forth very much that we had last time. But this time we're here to talk about your neck. And uh, I remember when you were on the show last time, a couple weeks ago, if you kind of read between the lines, it seemed like you weren't feeling 100% about this date, October 30th. So tell us what happened. Why can't you fight on October 30th? Uh, you know, I'm always very transparent when it comes to the fans and I like to, uh, be very open as much as I can be without, you know, revealing too much of my personal life. But I think with a sport like this, it's about the entertainment. And I think, um, that's the reason why I even have the fan base that I do have is because people like that I'm genuine, I'm real, and I, I keep it a buck all the time, you know? So, um, with that, I, I spoke openly about it, like, hey, man, and I even talked to my coaches and I spoke to some of my housemates who also fight. And I told them, like, yo, honestly, the way this training camp has been going, I'm probably just going to lose weight and go out there and just wing it again and see what the fuck happens. That's honestly how I felt, because I was like, we, I'm struggling to get through two rounds. Um, and then to get to the third round, I'm pretty much throwing zero punches because my arms are just so fatigued that I just can't even get through anything. Like, my legs were fine. Lungs felt okay. Um, like I felt like I was doing the, all the cardio work, but then anytime I would, I would have a hard week, I have a sparring session. Of course, I'm sparring with Marab. So that's a pretty high rubric yeah. to use. Um, but even so, like we sparred multiple times for years and nothing's ever changed. I think it's just the fact that I had such a big surgery and it's been such a long time that the nerves were pressed and the atrophy that I had. Um, just so people have an, a better idea of the timeline, when I got cleared to start training three months after and to go full, so it was April 15th, I had the surgery, so May 15th, June 15th, July 15th. I just got back from Georgia, and I was like, let me give myself at least another week, even though I know that I got this fight on the horizon. Let me give myself another week before we start really, really hitting it. As soon as we got back, man, I had my first day training. I hurt my shoulder. Damn. Uh, and I'm doing jujitsu. I posted on the ground, hurt my shoulder. Do you think, and, uh, a quick timeout, do you think that was as a result of the neck or totally coincidental? I, I, I don't know. Okay. I, I went down to the PI um, recently and I had them look at it and they couldn't figure out what it was either. And um, nothing was torn, but the shoulder was very lax. Like it was co coming out the socket, but not like the, when I, it's the same shirt, so shoulder that I had the surgery on. So between the shoulder and the neck, there's just so much going on with the human body, you know? And um, I, I've competed like this for a very, very long time. So for me to have gotten to where I've gotten to and have to have dealt with all those things, I think it's just the culmination, the culmination of all the time just accumulated. And it was just like, yo, you need to let the nerves do its thing and kind of heal up and, and get back to a, a, a normal baseline for where you were before and hopefully progress better in that in terms of, now you have the surgery. Now there's no more pinching of the nerves. There's no more radiating pain down to my fingertips. Um, there's just the, the fatigue, you know? So I spoke to the doctor uh, and he said, it's normal for that to happen. And he said 12 to 18 months is typically when someone comes back from uh, surgery and 
especially at the, not even like, cause it's not like football. Like people get the surgery for football, but it's different. It's not like the endurance where you have to be able to go like MMA. It's a different type of um, explosiveness. It's a different type of endurance when you're squeezing and then going to punches is you're doing a short burst for football and things like that, you know? So it's a very different dynamic in terms of what you got to do to prepare and to compete. And I think that's the big difference, you know, where for me, they were optimistic of how fast my strength came back where I was in June. And he was like, yeah, I think you'd be good to possibly fight after November 1st. And then we were booked for October 30th. I was like, okay, we, I think we could try to make this work. I originally wanted December because I thought it would have made sense to give myself a little bit more time and still be able to get one more fight in before the end of the year. And uh, sure enough, things weren't going the way I thought it was going to go. Um, like I said, man, I know Marab is a hard rubric to use, but I've done, I've done this with him before for the last two training camps with, um, uh, Pideon, the first fight that he pulled out of that people keep forgetting he pulled out of, keep saying his visa issues. He said he had his visas taken care of. So for you folks who keep saying that stupid shit, he had his visas taken care of. He pulled out a fight with no injury. So for me to actually pull out of a fight with actually medical clearance that I'm not ready and fit to actually do five rounds, I think that's a pretty good le- logical reason to not want to be paralyzed in the octagon. I'm not looking to be the first person to win a belt by DQ and the first guy to be in the octagon and be paralyzed in the cage. Yeah. So I'm sorry that if I think my health is more important and the longevity of me living in my body, my capsule for the rest of my life is more important than proving some stupid beef. Um, who's the, the better fighter when I'm not even at a hundred percent yet, you know? So uh, Jan can say whatever he wants. He can talk all the shit he wants. He posted some shit with me and my fiance I don't know if he was, he thought it was trying to be funny saying like, Oh, he's got a new job now. Instead of fighting, he's doing this stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'm doing stuff, activities with my fiance. Good job. Thank, thank you for sending me a picture of my fiance and I trying to make a joke, posting it on social media, thinking that I, I, I don't know what he thought it was. If it was like me out partying or some shit, I'm like, I'm out with my, my lady. I'm out with my lady. Do I post pictures of you and your lady saying you pulled out of the fight? Do I post pictures of you and your kids saying you pulled out of, of, of the fight? So it's like, what are you, what are we doing? I don't know if he didn't know that was my fiance. I'm pretty sure he knows what my fiance looks like. So it's not, you know, but that's a whole nother topic. I just think the guy's a piece of shit. You know, that's just my personal opinion of the guy. And I just really can't wait to get back in there and smack the fuck out of him. I I, I want to fight him, but there's going to be a point in the fight where I'm telling you, I'm just going to slap the fuck out of him. I, I, I'm just going to slap the shit out of him. I have to say there was a part of me that was a little relieved that, you know, this news came through because when I talked to you, I felt like you weren't a hundred percent about it. And to your point, it's a neck and a very bad thing could happen if your neck isn't hundred percent. And we've never seen that type of injury in the UFC. And I don't think anyone wants to see that type of injury. And so at what point did you start to feel like this isn't going to work out? October 30th is just too soon. Uh, man, a couple of weeks ago, maybe even when we spoke and I just knew like usually around that time, um, the endurance just wasn't coming back to me. I was fatiguing, doing pull-ups. Um, not that I couldn't do pull-ups. I was doing pull-ups where I do my static holds and part of my strength and conditioning, which gives me the squeeze, squeezing endurance that I have been having over my entire career since college wrestling, where I hold the bar 50, uh, one minute straight or a little bit longer, and I'll do three levels, 20 seconds up top, um, half, squ- half uh, release, and then not all the way extended, but slightly bent so I could get like all different levels of the pull, and I could only hold it for like – 15, 20 seconds. I was like, yo, something's wrong, man. And this is after an off day, you know, um, I would spar and I would do all these resistance exercises to be ready for the next sparring session. And then I'll go spar after one round of throwing punches. The next round, I could barely keep my arms up and obviously getting punched in the face in sparring that many times. Um, it could be a little deflating in terms of knowing where you were and knowing where you're at now. It mentally kind of, it, fucks you up, man. It really does. Especially knowing that you got a fight on the horizon and you're wondering if you're doing yourself uh, a disservice by one showing up and trying to perform for the fans and not giving them another good show. If for me to give them two bad shows in a row would just be on me at that point. Um, I don't want to do that. You know, I want to make sure the fans get their money's worth and I want to make sure they get the, the actual fight um, performance that they deserve to see, to see who's really the best, not some shell of someone and say, Oh, that's, that's not the guy that we, paid to see you know so a couple of weeks ago i i kind of had a feeling like this is like i said i talked to my roommates and uh i told them like i'm just gonna go in there and just try to try to wing it and see if i can maybe fight a little bit more conservative conservatively and try to see if maybe i can get a takedown and maybe pull off a hail mary 
And my roommate, uh, Steve, just goes like, why would you do that? I'm like, well, you've seen the training session. He's like, yeah, I know, but you don't think maybe we got still, we still got five weeks because five and a half weeks, you still think we could try to figure this, uh, figure this out. This was actually six and a half weeks because um, this was um, two, almost a week and a half ago. So I go, yeah, we can try, but we can see that I'm not getting any type of progression, no matter how much work I do during the week and trying to build. It's just I'm at the same baseline level where if I took off a couple of days, and I, I don't know. I do think the overtraining, as soon as I got cleared, I was just hitting the ground, running, redlining. I didn't build a foundation. I didn't do anything. I just started going like, hey, we got to fight. We got to go. And that's it. You know, so um, part of it, I think, is a little bit of overtraining. Part of it, I think, is still a little bit of the recovery process because I took off three, four days last week during Marab's fight week. Um and this week has actually been the best that I've ever felt physically. Like in terms of actually, we did a boxing sparring session last night. I got Adrian Giannis out here um, from Texas, another hot prospect at the bandweight division. And um, uh, the kid's fucking good, by the way. The kid's fucking good. And uh, <laughs> but uh, other than that, that was the best I felt. Where after the, the first and second round, I'm not sitting on the floor, taking off my gloves, trying to stretch my arms out because. I just can't hold the gloves on my arms and keep them on in between the break rounds, you know? So as that's the guy that people want to see step into the octagon, then you can go fuck yourself. That's one. And two, um, for the people that actually do care that, you know, want to make sure that I'm actually doing the right thing. You know, this was a very hard decision because I don't pull out of fights. I pulled out of one fight with Mitch Gang Young and my manager advised it, my hurt my wrist. And then the very next week, my wrist was better. And I was hoping that this wasn't going to be the case, you know, so I'm still not there yet, but I think the extra time will allow me to get to where I need to be. And uh, it would make me feel a lot more comfortable knowing that I could push the five rounds again, where the last few training camps, I would, I would spar with two or three different training partners and get through those rounds and still look fresh in the fifth round, you know? So that's where I want to be. Cause that's, that's the cardio type of level that we have over here in terms of our team, you know? So um I just think now is not the right time. I asked for December and possibly this fight being a war. We could probably possibly not fight till January, February. If this fight's quick, I think Sandman has a really good chance of smoking on. I really do. I think one guy's super flat footed. The other guy's very dynamic and can end the fight at any given second. Um, in, in uh, Corey Sanhagen. So if he gets a quick finish, I think we could possibly turn it around and end up fighting and doing a rematch in uh, December. Wow. Okay. I was going to ask you about the fight. Um, but there's uh, some of your insight. Of course, you have the win over Corey Sanhagen back in uh, June of last year. Yes, Feng Jitsu represent. Um, <laughs> my, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the UFC doctor was the one who didn't clear you ultimately, Dr. Davidson. Is that accurate? Well, my surgeon, that's one. Uh -huh. He consults with the UFC doctor, and then they go from there, and he gives him the uh, diagnosis of what he sees from his professional viewpoint. And... Um, he tested my, my strength. This is one test where you put your arm straight down and he manually tries to break your arm and pull it in. And you're supposed to be able to keep your arm firm. I'm still having some cramping in both triceps. Uh, the left one's where most of the damage was from the neck injury. Uh, and um, so he still knows that there's a little bit of weakness. He said the strength is definitely almost all the way back, but there's still some weakness. And you could tell that the, the nerves are still trying to, I don't know, want to use the wrong term, but regenerate or heal or or come back together kind of thing for just from all the trauma that happened with the surgery and all the years of it being uh, pressed on. Okay. Um, and so ultimately when was the call made to, uh, to move on and not have you in this fight? Was it, was it on Saturday? Mm, it was last week, Wednesday, I saw the doctor in LA and then I spoke to Dr. Davis, Dr. The, the UFC doctor. I don't know if I should be saying his name or not, but I spoke to the UFC doctor and I told him, I was like, give me one more day. Let me see if it was the overtraining that was killing me. I had my best sparring session the very next day where I actually, like I said, I didn't fall over. And that was at Syndicate MMA. I went one of the guys, uh, uh, Shane Shapiro, amateur, amateur fighter. I don't think he made his pro debut yet, but he's very good. Just starting his training camp. So it wasn't like I was going with Marab, who's peaking. I was going with a guy who's kind of like around the same uh, conditioning level that I was at. So I could get an honest opinion of where I am. And even going through that, I was like, yeah, I definitely had a better day. I didn't collapse after doing the three rounds where I'm laying on my back and trying to rip the gloves off so I could try to shake my arms out. But uh, I was still pretty tired where I should not be like that with, with five and a half weeks out from a fight, you know? So I asked Dr. Davidson for that, um, that chance to try to save the fight and keep it together. 
And just based on that, I was like, I just don't think I'm going to be able to get my body right to do five and a half, uh, five rounds, um, a p- possible five rounds with Pideon, you know? So, um, he's a tough dude. Like I always give the fighters respect, my opponents respect. Um, I just think when you're phony about like how you feel about your opponent, I think it gets a little weird when he's like trying to apologize for throwing an intentional knee and then trying to tell me that I'm fake. And I faked the, knee, the injury from the knee when you blasted me in the head after being told by the ref not to do it. And now your other corner telling you to do it. Like this whole thing, Ariel could have been avoided. I just hope the fans understand that though. The reasonable fans with the brain actually understand that, that this was all because of Petey Young, that this division is now in this situation. It's because of him. He could have won the fight. He was on his way of dominating. Um, he, he started to pull away. He was beating my ass all fourth round. Uh, I still landed two head kicks right before I shot in and then he knee me in the head. Uh, but he was beating my ass. That's, that's a fact, you know, but this is all his fault because he's that stupid. You know, you want a champ that doesn't know the rules and, and does illegal tries to get away with slide dirty shit. I mean, to each his own, you know, but this is all on him. He's the reason this we're, we're in this situation to begin with, you know, we could have been going on. I could have been still recovering, doing my own thing, not having clown emojis on my page because I'm healing from a surgery and things would have been normal, you know, regular or, I don't even know. Can you call that normal? Whatever. Things would have been different, you know, but this guy did this. He caused this. This is not my doing. This is what he did. I'm sorry that he didn't abide by the rules. I'm I'm sorry that he's a fucking moron. That's that's really what this comes down to, you know? So has there been any was, at the end of the day, I, I make out from this, you know, you know, I get paid more. I now get the pay-per-view points and whatever. So in hindsight, do I want to win the belt like that? Hell fucking no. But at the end of the day, I end up actually doing better than I would have, you know? So I get an opportunity to, I almost feel like God is giving me a second opportunity knowing how hard I work. I'm telling you, when you see the, the demon type of work I put in for the, those last two training camps with my neck still like that, I feel like God kind of gave me a, a, a second chance at like, yo, we're going to give you another opportunity to do this the right way and really prove everyone that you really did deserve to be here. You, you fought Corey Sanhagen, who was the highest ranked guy that should have been for the title. And now we're going to give you an opportunity to beat Peter Jan and, and do it the right way this time when you're actually feeling good and we can see who is the real better man. And that's all I care about. I don't care about if uh, he beats me or not. I don't, I never care about the wins and losses. I care about the performance. And if I perform good, that usually results in a W. So that's, that's the type of mindset that I have. So if people can't respect that, uh, it is what it is. You've never been af- probably never been an athlete or probably never been an athlete at the highest level. So uh, I think anyone with um, who's been through the grind, whether it's their field of work, whether it's an athlete and they know what it feels like to put work in day in and day out to get to where you want to be. That's a special accomplishment and no one can ever take that away from me. I'm sure you've seen people say that you should be stripped. Was there any talk of stripping you? No, uh, I spoke to the matchmakers about that because I was actually – uh, concerned about that and not even concerned about the belt. I was concerned that I would get passed up in, like I said before, even after the fight was I didn't want to get passed up in an opportunity to get the challenge for the belt again. And that's all it comes down to for me. Cause again, I felt like I just won an opportunity. And even though I did get an opportunity, I blew it. I fucked up. I decided to eat two pancakes and two eggs the day of the fight and not eat from 10 30 to eight o'clock at night. Um, when I fought where I didn't, I, I went from a 10 30 AM window to 8 30 PM where I fought and I didn't eat. That's on me. Two pancakes, two eggs after doing a 20 minute hard workout. That's the most idiotic thing I could have ever done in my life. And as a veteran, I'm, I'm ashamed to even know that I've made such a rookie mistake. So I had the opportunity. I blew it, but I feel like the stars aligned and, you know, even though it was a foul, I get another chance to do it the right way, you know, and that's all I could care about, you know? So when I'm on, man, you guys see Marab, this guy, that's who I'm training with. That's who I'm working with. I do think we have two of the best guys in the world in under one gym, under one roof, you know? So I push him, he pushes me. I know my cardio is on point. I know I'm helping him with the technic- technical side of with the wrestling, keeping the control and things like that. Ying, you know, one hand washes the other. I, I didn't get here by accident. We, we grinded, we put work in. I earned my spot. Marab earned his spot, you know, Anyone in the UFC who, who got to the UFC, we didn't get handouts, you know? So for anyone who wants to disrespect us and say the shit that they want to say because we're looking out for our health for the first time in, in my career, I'm actually looking out for my health where it's not just I stub my toe. I actually have a disc, a metal freaking object in my neck where if it dislodges, it hits my spinal cord and that's it. 
And that's, that's, that's something that people are okay with me taking that risk. I mean, if that makes you sleep better at night, if you feel like, Oh, you're such a warrior, kudos to you, man. I'll, I'll clap it up for you. Cause you're so tough. You're such a badass. Oh, such a badass. Speaking of that, any concern at all right now that you may never fight again, that it just doesn't heal and it's too risky for you to fight. Um, I've, I, if I'm being honest, I have had those thoughts and I, I, I before I took the days off, I was like, I'm just wondering if this is just it. If I'm never going to be able to actually push past this. And uh, it was a very scary thing. But then, I, you know, I was trying to keep the, the optimism because the doctor said it usually takes 12 months to 18 months for everything to really get back to where it can be. And everyone is different. You know, he thinks I healed really fast just on the strength standpoint. But obviously the other parts are still doing this thing where it's not firing the right way. And um, I think it's just going to come back with time. And I think me actually taking those days off. Yeah. So yeah, to answer your question, I was concerned with potentially having a career ending surgery and um, it would have been very unfortunate to go out like that, you know, cause uh, I'm a very prideful man based on my, just based on the things that I've done. Cause I, I, I take good pride. And I think everyone should be like this, take pride in the things that they've earned. You don't need to boast about it, but I think to take pride in the things that you've earned for yourself, is something to, you can always look back on and be like, man, I did that. I put the work in. I did that. That's me who went out there and accomplished that because of the things I did behind the scenes that no one's seen. People didn't see the late nights. People didn't see the early mornings. They didn't see none of those sessions when you're coming in by yourself and doing in the extra work, you know? So um, it would have been very unfortunate to have my career ended short like that. And um, I am very, now I'm more optimistic about it that I will be able to get back to, to competition and compete at a high level still. Um, I'm still competing in the room. Like I said, I'm just getting tired, overly tired, like five and a half weeks. It's just not enough time for me to um, properly prepare and probably not even probably lose the weight. You know, I was coming down from 170. I'm finally keeping my body under 160. This morning is 156.6. This is the best physical shape I've been in feeling like, you know, like muscle bound. But like I said, I'm strong. But the other part of it is what actually matters. Those You can have all the muscles in the world. If you can't go longer than two minutes, I don't give a shit, you know? So I could look like all the action figure in the world, G.I. Joe, but if I can't compete for 25 minutes, what's the point? So when you, you say know, so. you say typically it's 12 to 18 months, you had the surgery yeah. in April. That would mean yes. April 2022 to October 2022. Is that when yeah. we're going to see you? Because then you said December. No, so no, I'm, no. I, I asked for December, but that's not, that's not, that's not even 12 months. That's like eight months. That's like eight, eight months. Yeah. That's enough time. I think, I I think so. I, like I said, I, when I took the days off and then I did the the training session the next day, I felt way better. I felt like, okay, this is actually a good baseline where I can work off of this, you know? So if things keep progressing like that, I'm actually going back to the PI um, this Sunday or Monday, depending. I got to spend some quality time with the lady, with the fiance. Yeah, I feel you. So yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, I know you guys feel me on that one. I feel you. So I, feel you. <laughs> I got to go out and uh, I told them I'll be back doing some strength and conditioning with them, doing my more PT work, stabilizing the shoulder and really focusing on getting everything right. Um, Cause like I said, I left Vegas to come back home to get ready for a fight. So I cut my PT short. So I do think that all kind of plays a hand in, with each other, you know? So um, is you don't know what's going to happen with the human body. I can sit here and say, yeah, I'll be ready by December and maybe I'm not, but I truly do believe just me taking those days off made a tremendous impact on where I was able to go physically. And then for where I was last night sparring, we're going to spar again tomorrow. And then I'm going to do one more session with, um, Giannis on Saturday and, um, I'll be able to really get a better gauge on where I am in a physical standpoint, you know? So that's what it all comes down to for me. Um, and I think that's given me a lot more hope and knowing that I can come back to the sport and return and actually do things the way I used to um, without the 12 to 18 months. You know, okay. uh, I don't think it's going to be that long. And I spoke to the, we spoke to the UFC. They say it's usually after a year when things start to get like really crazy. I mean, you've seen injuries in the past where guys were out for years before they created an interim title, you know? So for me, I'm hoping that's not the case. Um, I don't think that is going to be the case. Uh, to, to ask for me to be stripped because you're angry that your fighter is a, is a dope. That's, uh, I don't know. That kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but um, I actually was in the process of posting a troll picture. Oh no. Um, Cause I like to troll, you know, oh, I like gosh. to get under the people's skins. What do you got? 
I know you. I know you like my trolling. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> what do you got? What do you got? I'll tell you if it's a good picture or not. Uh it's it's gonna it's gonna ruffle some feathers. Um, oh, what is it? But I, you know, maybe it's it's all it's all. It's what all, is it, Alja? What is it? All, tell us. Did, Give us the the did, the sneak did, peek. We're we're gonna get back in the octagon and we're gonna fight. At the, that's at the end of the day, people <laughs> gotta realize that that no matter what is said on the outside, you gotta answer for your words, and that's the beautiful thing about this. It book. is. So, Jan can say whatever he wants. San Hagen can say all the shit he wants. I can say all the shit I want. We're gonna have to step back in there with each other and figure it out. You know? Okay, so, but here's the thing: you you imply that you think San Hagen might win. Is there a part of yeah. you, considering your feelings towards Jan and the history, who's rooting for Jan to win this fight so that you can set? Because if Jan loses, I mean, who knows when we get this rematch? Because then you're um, probably gonna have to fight San Hagen next. Yeah, it's it's so the way I feel about it is more. I, and I saw Corey Sanhagen at UFC 266 in Vegas, and we spoke after the fights. And um, like I said, I'm a very honest man. And I told him, I was like, you know, I feel like you, I asked him if he was taking the fight. He said, yes. I said, good luck. And um, I said, I know you're going to smoke him. And I said, the only thing about this that annoys me is that you're going to be the first one to do it. And that bothers me. Uh, I was like, because I know I can beat this guy. And I said it just like that to his face. You can ask him just like that, because I know how good Corey is. I know how good Jan is, but it's just stylistic matchups. Yeah. I know when I'm on my toes and moving, doing the same shit Corey's doing, but adding in the wrestling and taking you down, that third of that takedown and constantly being on your back and potentially getting submitted or getting ground pounded, it's a real threat. And Corey Sanhagen being able to pick you apart from the outside while you're flat-footed trying to throw these one-twos down the middle and you're trying to do this peekaboo shell shit and the guy's longer and he's touching you up from the outside. That's a hard fight. Jan's going to have to land something big over and over to win that fight. And I really think San Higgins is a smarter fighter. What's Jan going to do? Try to wrestle him? What I what I heard people saying is, oh, Ster, uh, Jan was able to wrestle fuck Sterling, so he's going to be able to do the same thing to Corey. I'm like, if you're using that fight with myself and Jan as a rubric to see where Peter Jan's wrestling is at, you are so far off that it's not it's not even comparable. If you think anyone could kick my ankle and I just fall on my butt like that and do a freaking turtle dance on my butt like I'm breakdancing, you, you, like I said, that was the worst performance of my life, the worst way I felt going into a fight. And again, if you think that's a real assessment of my wrestling abilities, you don't know shit about what you're watching. And if you think all the other wrestling exchanges that PDON has is that's what trumps that, you don't know the sport. You don't know what you're watching. And just because of that, you guys are going to see that he's going to try to do that to um, Corey Sanding and, and see that it's not that very easy. Same thing TJ Dillashaw tried to do. Not very easy. Right. You got to have a certain type of strength. You got to have a certain type of endurance and you got to have a certain type of uh, skill set in order to do stuff like that, you know? And um, I'm not saying like I'm the best guy, but um, best guy in the world type of thing, but I know that I'm comfortable in my own skin and what I'm able to do when I'm on, when I'm on, man, Look at my performances. They speak for themselves, you know? So, um, yeah, I would like to fight Peter Jan again. Whether or not he loses this fight, that's on him. He's got to be able to put the work in and and be able to uh, train for that matchup. Uh, he's got five and a half. He had five and a half weeks notice, so that's more than enough time. Uh, he had to know that matchup was going to come sooner rather than later, so I'm pretty sure he's watched Sandman fight. Um, but uh, I told the, sh the matchmaker at some point, I don't care what it is, but we're going to have to fight again. No matter what, before I retire, before he retires, we're fighting again. Simple as that. Well, I wish you the best, Aljo. I'm sorry this happened. Uh, get well soon. I hope we get to see that fight against Jan. I'd love to see the uh, San Hagen uh, rematch as well. And uh, I will let that uh, case speak for itself. Thanks, my man. Get well soon. Thanks for doing it. <laughs> Peace, guys. There he is, yeah. the Funk Master, Aljamain Sterling, the Bantamweight champion. We wish him the best. Unfortunate situation. Uh, but I do agree, San Hagen is going to be a tough matchup for one Piotr Jan. And remember, I did uh, I did predict many moons ago that San Hagen at some point in his career, and I even doubled down on it after the Aljo loss, and I doubled down on it uh, after the TJ Dillashaw very close loss. Uh, I believe that man will be a UFC champion at some point. This is his opportunity. He's got to get it done here. He's been given a great chance. They went to uh, to TJ, obviously TJ coming off surgery. They then went to Rob Font. They've uh, they booked Rob Font against uh, Jose Aldo in December. And so there's Corey Sanhagen. I think it's a very appropriate fight for a interim title fight. 
And on Monday, we will talk to Corey Sanhagen about all of that. So stay tuned. Wanted to get Aljo's side of the story first, uh, and then we'll get Corey's side of the story on Monday. I've lost the eraser on my SpongeBob pencil over here. I'm very upset about this. Um, if anyone can tell me where my eraser is, I'd be very happy. All right. Thank you very much to uh, Aljamain Sterling. Now we get to the flyweight hour, the flyweight portion of the program. Later in the show, we'll talk to Johnny Walker, one half of the main event on Saturday going up against Thiago Santos. We'll also talk to Morgan Charrier, the last pirate of France, who's headlining the Cage Warriors card on Friday. We've got three Cage Warriors cards this week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, their trilogy once again in London. Um, and then we're going to talk to Mighty Mouse Johnson before Morgan about his big fight on December 5th on the one tenth anniversary show and uh, his recent loss back in April, all that and more. But in a matter of seconds, we're going to be joined by the greatest women's flyweight champion of all time. She was just uh, in action this past Saturday in Las Vegas, UFC 266, completely dominating, as most people suspected she would, Lauren Murphy. She's, in my opinion, one of the greatest female fighters of all time and in my opinion she is one of the 10 best fighters on the planet regardless of gender that's how highly i think of her and her skills she is the bullet valentina shevchenko and she joins us now once again via the magic of zoom hello valentina how are you hello ariel everything good thank you oh so good to talk to you again valentina and congratulations on the win i suspect you're at the uh performance center because your sister antonina is fighting this saturday Yes, exactly. We just <clears throat> we just finished uh, her training, and it's kind of like sir, uh, Wednesday, Thursday. It's uh, mostly weight cuts. Yeah, and we are right here, getting ready for the whole like procedure. But we have to go through the fight week, but the fight week for her. Yes, and we are still in Las Vegas. <laughs> yes, uh, and she has a big fight coming up on Saturday against the undefeated uh, Casey O'Neill. So I wish her. Uh, the best in that fight to go from your fight week, big title fight to your sisters the following week. Do you like that? Or do you wish there was a little more time in between the two fight weeks? I think that is um, kind of like n nice to have this like um, close fighting days because it's, we have any way we're going to train together. Any way we will do like everything, helping each other. And it's kind of like uh, fighting separated for with a long distance. It will be like to have a uh, longer training camp for both of us. But this way we can fight, we can train, and then we can rest together. So it's kind of like nice. I would prefer to fight even like the same event. For me, it would be better. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, it's kind of like this last week it's my fight week and my training is going a little bit low in intensity but your training is still like increasing right. so uh, ideally it's to fight in the same night <laughs> why did you ask them to do that i mean it's just one week off why didn't they have her fight last weekend uh, no, I think it was all about like uh, how everything worked because it's also not about just like, okay, we have uh, two people. We have to have four people, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> to make two fights. So it's uh, sometimes it's work. It worked one time, but uh, sometimes it's like that. So it's kind of like um, not every time you happen, but it will happen occasionally. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you're at the Performance Center, so I give you another uh, pass on not having the ukulele, although there was some talk that maybe the ukulele would make an appearance <laughs> you didn't bring it to the gym i suspect right yes but i was getting ready i was prepared i was tuned and it's like it was everything ready and then like okay i have to be there i uh, if it would be a little bit later i would have time to come back oh, home my God. but now it is like straight just finishing and i'm here <laughs> all right well you're a professional so i appreciate that um, by the way, uh, were you in Los Angeles on Monday for the uh, promotion of your, your upcoming movie with Halle Berry? Exactly. Wow. Yes. So you went from the fight to do promotion for the movie. No rest for you. <laughs> no rest at all. Why Why I have to rest too much? No, there is no time to rest. It's right. It's time to work. It's time to like uh, do beautiful things for the action. <laughs> yes. And uh, we're looking at a picture of you and Hallie that you uh, that you posted 
on your Instagram. Did she watch the fight? And if so, what did she say about it? Oh, yes. She, she, she told me that uh, there was a, a opening for the, uh, uh, like in Los Angeles, you know, it was like a big gala event and everything like that. And she said, um, I was watching the fight on my phone, like he uh, hiding it from everyone. And uh, she said, like, when I saw the, uh, the finish coming in, and, like you and you mean, uh, I was screaming and everybody was like looking at me and said, like, what's happening? Uh -huh. No one understood what's happening. <laughs> it was way, amazing to see her. Yeah, she's a legend. Why did you have to do promotion for the movie if it's coming out in November? Why Why in September? Well, it's kind of like um, uh, Haley now, she's kind of like doing um, many things, like uh, not only promotion one time, she's doing like appear, uh, she's doing um, appearance in different events. And um, I was coming like to uh, in uh, to join her for this particular event, what we did. So it's going to be uh, not just this time, it's going to be way, way, way much more okay. <laughs> coming on to November. Well, let her know the next time you talk to her that I'd love to have her on this program as well to, uh, you know, to promote the movie <laughs> whenever it comes out. That would be quite the thrill. Um, speaking of thrilling, okay. <laughs> thank you. The, your your performance on Saturday once again flawless. Were you happy with your performance? I suspect your your toughest critic, your harshest critic. Were you happy with what you did against Lauren Murphy on Saturday? You know, it's kind of like um, every time. Um, what's the most important and what I did, what I had to do, retain my belt, right? Yes. But there is like i think um, every time even in the perfect like comp uh, competition in the perfect performance you can find something what you can uh, do better right and no matter what no matter how i think this is very important to have this kind of mindset that you are not okay i so satisfied i did everything what i had to do then you kind of like relaxed but when even from the perfect performance you can find something to get and like back into the gym and improve that means that you are still like in your mindset it's still life it's still mo still moving forward it's still something that you want to be better and uh, this is what i look up to i don't want to stop i don't want to find everything every time something but but i will i will do better next time so you know to someone like myself and to most people, like I said, flawless performance, um, you're so dominant. But I'm curious, from your mind, what would you improve on? What didn't you like about that performance? I liked everything. I liked everything about this particular performance. But it's, I, I mean, like you still would say yeah okay i would probably do like more spinning back kicks okay. more jumping kicks i would do more like something different technique or like pacing there from the yeah, stand up to the ground like more quickly or more like things like that i mean like just details that what you you can do better just like small details that you think you can improve but i'm happy with my performance performance completely <laughs> was she was she tougher than you thought she would be like was it harder to put her away than you suspected uh you know i knew that lauren she's a tough uh, fighter and she has good skills she has uh like uh everything and uh don't judge a fighter by our fight mm. by fighting with me mm -hmm. look at her fight when she was fighting with different girls and it's like it's completely you will understand how tough she is what a power she has and like it's very dangerous she she kind of like uh you have to take a note on, on everything but uh as i was mentioning that my goal as a martial artist to uh show that people who has like uh amazing skills it's kind of like there is no equal and this is what my goal in martial arts it's like to get to this level to reach that level as i say that you can finish your opponents but they cannot touch you so this is a like perfection in my understanding <laughs> okay so that that is actually a perfect segue to my next question at the beginning of the interview i said i think skill wise you are 
one of the 10 best fighters on the planet, regardless of male or female. Do you agree with me? I, I definitely agree with you. <laughs> Why I have to be, be not agree with you? <laughs> well, you know, sometimes I'm happy you said that, Valentina, because I was expecting you to say, oh, it's not for me. You're, you're a very humble person. But I think skill wise, you are top 10. And I think you can start to make a case eight, seven, six, like you're that damn good. And so I'm happy to hear that you believe that as well. You think, yeah. I shouldn't be just on a female pound for pound. I'm one of the best fighters on the planet today, regardless of gender. You see the difference, Ariel. Um, I would not say about myself that never. I'm not the kind of person that uh, like uh, sitting and screaming from the old corner. Okay, I'm the best one. Give me my like best pound per pound. And like, oh, give me my best pound per pound. I'm the best. No, I don't think this is the right person. Uh, everyone has to have their like honor for like uh, doing great things, but not uh, yelling it from the every corner. And, uh, but if, for example, you see the difference, if you say that, it's not I said, yes, you of course. said, then why I don't have to be agreeing? <laughs> I agree, like, I love that, I love that. Okay, so I'm gonna take it a step <laughs> further now, and I'm not just saying this, Valentina, because I've said it before, because you're here. I'm not just saying this because you're here. I think if you, fight Amanda Nunes next at 135, you're beating her. I think you beat Amanda Nunes next. Agree or disagree? And uh, this is my goal. This is my, uh, I know that uh, when we will have fight next time, it's going to be like, uh, I will be ready to do anything. So uh, definitely we have like, um, Time pass, like uh, uh, I am a different fighter. She's a different fighter than the last time we fought. And definitely in my mind, in my mindset, I don't have any kind of like, maybe if I will try, no. My mind is like only there, only forward. No matter, die, I have to die there, but I have to be in there. <laughs> And so I, I hope you, yeah. I hope you appreciate the last few times we've talked. I haven't really asked you about Amanda, but I feel like now's the time. The next fight, in my opinion, if she gets by Juliana Pena in December, I think this is the time to make it happen for the flyweight division to allow new people to come up. And also there's not a lot of people for her at 135 or 145. This is the time, like mid 2022, the trilogy, one of the biggest fights in female MMA history, women's MMA history. Amanda Valentina three. Do you agree? Is now the time to make this happen? You know, I kind of feel that she's a kind of like doesn't want too much that fight happen because uh, inside of herself, she feels that um, she was gifted uh, the victory from uh, our second fight, uh, uh, gifted by judges. And she feels that she was beaten by smaller girls from the smaller weight class. And she's a bigger girl. And it's kind of like, uh, pressure her from the inside. And that's why she kind of like keep on saying, look, like, ah, I want her twice. I want her like whatever she's saying. But uh, it's kind, kind of like, um, these guys, uh, like, um, camouflage of what she's feeling like in real. And definitely if you was like beaten by someone smaller than you, like in, like in two different, in two sizes, it uh, would affect you. That's why I feel she's kind of like, uh, mm, yeah, I don't want it to fight happening. <laughs> I love this, Val Valentina. This is very exciting. So in other words, you are saying she's trying to avoid the fight because she knows in her heart in Edmonton that you beat her, that she was given a gift from the judges and she wants nothing to do because she doesn't want to do this a third time and lose to you officially. Is that what you're saying? Um, you know, it's it's kind of like makes sense well, uh, exactly this way, because if you see uh, and listen to her interviews all the time and she's kind of like, no, why I have to fight her? I beat her twice. I don't have nothing to do with that. And it's kind of like when you start to defend yourself, like in this aggressive uh, like uh, style, mm -hmm. it means that um, inside of you, you have something that it's saying like, oh no, you're guilty. <laughs> and inside of your head, it's saying that, oh no, girl, you lost that fight. <laughs> well, this is great. This is what we've been waiting for from you. So will you go to the UFC after her fight in December and say, now's the time to make this fight. Let's go. Third fight trilogy. Let's do it. 
You know, Ariel, I'm uh, here. I didn't have to go and ask. I'm not the person that like, oh, need uh, give me that, give me those. Like, I need to do that. I don't like people who are like uh, do that. I don't like people that who say like, oh no, I deserve the uh, deserve the five bonus. Give me my money. I don't like like that when people like starting to ask for themselves. Is they doing like amazingly great? everything they will be given by by uh, like because in you see all professionals they understand who deserves who not right and it's just like my uh, my opinion that uh you don't have to come and every time constantly ask about everything you don't have to ca- uh, come and ask about like put me in the number one position pound per pound please do that i don't feel it's right i don't feel it's right if you have an owner you would like do your things like greatly in the best way what you can and then when it's gonna be like inevitable happening like that fight it's gonna happen but when it's gonna happen it's gonna be like way 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 much bigger than uh in the like opportunity when someone goes there and asks let's do that fight (laughs) sure i get that i think it's it's on you know we, we do enough of that and that's not your style you strike me as a very competitive person. You want to be tested, right? You want to see just how good you are. And so I'm wondering if at this point you look around, it would be fair to say, given the possibilities, the options for you at 125, this is the biggest test that you can have right now in your career, right? Like this is the type of thing that I think really gets you excited to fight her, to finally be the one to beat her, as opposed to fighting just another flyweight out there, right? I mean, we let's be honest. Yeah, this, is, this is the biggest test for you, right? This is your chance to show you are the greatest of all time. Uh, this is my opinion. Yes, you for like, uh, I'm the person that um, never was choosing my opponent. I know that many people like they have like, uh, okay, this is a list and I will see who I fight, who I not. And like managers, like they, they choose, okay, this is a good fight for us. We take it. This is not good fight for us. We don't take. In my career, in my experience, I every time was like, Valentina, are you going to fight this girl? Yes, I'm going to fight her. Are you going to fight this? Yes, I'm going to fight. I never said no. No one time I never said I won't fight her. And this is my mindset that no matter what, um, like, Valentina, you're going to fight, I will fight. Because this is my soul. This is my fight spirit. This is what I do. This is martial arts. And definitely it's uh, when it's going to happen, I'm going to be as, like ready as uh, like ready, ready. <laughs> More ready than ready. <laughs> this is very important stuff that we're doing here. I hope you know. If, if Dana White calls you up or Hunter Campbell calls you tonight and said, Valentina, Amanda next, what do you say? Um... Then we go with details. Ah, what, what, are you, what are you talking about details? Are we talking money? You want to bet? You want to get paid? No, just details, dates, uh, location. Sure, sure. Uh, what, when, and then I will think about my preparations, and I will think about what I'm gonna do. I will have to have enough time to like because um you know um if it's gonna be too soon, it's not gonna be good because uh, uh you know I'm getting ready for every my fight very seriously yeah no matter who's my opponent i will be uh getting ready like super hard way and it's uh not just physically it's emotion uh, emotionally hard as well and that's why for after this hard training camp and the pressure during the fight week and the fight by itself, I will have to recover all my energy because, you know, sometimes you feel, um, you can see, uh, fighters, they are so exhausted. They didn't recover the energy, like mental energy well, and they just like, Come into the fight. They, oh no, I don't want to fight there. Mm. I don't want. I just uh, like I feel um, that hopefully it's gonna end soon. No matter how it's gonna end, I just tired to be here. I don't want to be that happen. I don't want to feel that. That's why I take very seriously to recover my energy back, to feel this desire to come back in the octagon and like put my, my performance in there, like spectacular way well the good news is she's fighting in december so there's a bit of time there so we'll see how it uh, all plays out would it be fair to say valentina that you will be disappointed if you don't get at some point 
I don't care if it's next year, two years. At some point, you'll be disappointed if that fight doesn't happen. Is that fair? Uh, you know, um, I'm not the person that will be like so stuck thinking about that kind of things. Because um, if you're standing to overthinking about like you're obsessed with uh, something, some fight, some fighter, like in the bad way, it's gonna affect your brain. <laughs> You're gonna get crazy. <laughs> I uh, still want to enjoy my life. Yeah. And I know that uh, leading to that fight, it's gonna happen someday. I, I, you know, I no doubt that it's not gonna happen. And, uh, but I not keep thinking about it all day long. Uh, why I have to do that? I'm not obsessed with this idea. I don't care. It's like, uh, it, I know it's happened. And this is everything that I have to know. When it's happening, it's going to be great. But I didn't have to walk and uh, waking up day by day thinking about that. No, because you're going to be tired of thinking, yeah. just thinking about that. When it's going to happen, like, uh, as uh, I was, um, someone asked me before this fight, fight, when I started to think about Lauren Murphy as my opponent and actually like uh, starting to uh, think that this fight is going to happen. And I answered, after I signed the contract, this is the way what I will do for that fight as well. After I sign it, I'm going to start to think about it. Right now, it's, there is no make sense. I want to enjoy my life. I want to do the things that bring me happiness. I want to do things that uh, are going to um, um, develop me as a person, not just a fighter, but a, a, a person as well, to learn something, to uh, explore something new, to explore different places. And I want to be the crazy one who's uh, thinking about like, oh, I have to fight, I have to fight. No, we are like fighters, but we are people as well. We are human and we have to enjoy the life because we have just one life. Amen. And if we spend thinking about a manga life, life, well, what's going to be? It's not going to be a life, right? That is true. Uh, by the way, like a month after your fight, like how big of a size difference is this going to be? How, how, do you mind if I ask like how big do you get when you're out of training camp? Because obviously she's a, she fights at 145 as well. So how big of a difference do you think this is going to be for you? As the same one, it's going to be different. Like uh, my work weight is 135. Oh, wow. I'm not going like uh, higher. If I stop training for like, uh, I don't know, a month, I probably go like 130. Uh, eight is the maximum. Wow. But I try to maintain my weight. So it's kind of like 135, uh, my work weight. Okay. So it's, uh, I'm not going to gain 140, 145. I am not going to do that because it's not good for my body and my performance. I know that, um, yeah, I have to be, I will be lighter. I was lighter already, but um, I want to be uh, fast and I don't want to be slow. <laughs> no, I understand that. I was just curious how big you actually get. By the way, before I let you go, and I hope uh, you know, I think I speak for everyone. We'd love to see that fight because I think you're you're the two best right now, and I think it would be an incredible, um, a, an incredible competition. Uh, I want to give you uh, props for what you said afterwards about the Octagon Girls on uh, Saturday. I thought that that was really cool. I thought it was really cool that you went up to them afterwards and took a picture with them. Why did you feel the need to do this? Was this because of what Khabib said about the Octagon Girls a month or so ago? Did you feel like as a woman you needed to show them some love as well and, and say that they are a part of the show and they deserve to be there too? No, you know, like uh, leading to the uh, fight, uh, on the fight, we, we definitely had like a lot of interviews with uh, uh, all media and they was just starting to bring up this question about uh, wrinkles. And but, uh, you know, uh, you know, in my opinion, like um, this don't have to be even uh, like spoken and not even mentioning this because uh, uh, definitely everyone has uh, their like right to do things what they think they can do in their local promotion whatever they do uh, want to do but uh, like uh, entirely um, like ring girls it's uh, like part of professional sport it's uh, like um 
how it was, how it will be. It's how it has to be because every time, like, um, it's just kind of like uh, beautiful to see beautiful woman in an event. And I would say uh, any event has to have beautiful women, right? <laughs> of course, why not? So uh, I, I just kind of like not even see why we have to discuss it because it's definitely how it has to be. And all ring girls, they are like in the amazing sports shape. They are like, uh, uh, it's kind of like um, good uh, way to watch in like between the uh, rounds. Yeah, it's from the practical, it's, uh, yeah, definitely they uh, show what ring, what a number of the rounds is it, but from the other side, it's just beautiful to watch them for everyone, for every, uh, for, for every man. And it's like, uh, um, it's a part, it's a part of culture, of professional sport. That's why it's uh, uh, it's kind of like no makes sense, any sense to speak, even mentioning that they are not on their places mm. because they are. <laughs> I would say beautiful for every man and every woman, right? Anyone can appreciate Exactly, that. for everyone, for every people. Right. Well said, Valentina, you're a class act, you're a true pro. I think we did a lot of good work here today in terms of when the fight gets made next year, we're going to look back on this interview and say this is when it really started. The ball started to actually move <laughs> towards making this trilogy. So thank you very much to you. Congratulations on the win. And good luck to your sister Antonina on Saturday as well. Thank you, Ariel. I will be in her corner. She's uh, like um, feeling so great. She's training so hard. And I feel the power. I feel the, a lot of like energy from her, from Antonina. She's like uh, in her mindset. I also see there is like no doubt, no hesitation. She's going to go and just like do her best to smash the goal. <laughs> I love it. A big fight. Uh, always a pleasure to talk to you, Valentina. Thank you for making the time. And we'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Thank you, Ariel. All Thank right, you. there she Bye -bye. is, Valentina Shevchenko. Woo wee! You heard it right there, my friends. You know, the last couple times I spoke to her, I, I didn't want to go there. She keeps getting hit up about the Nunes fight. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy asking the same questions as everyone else. But I felt like now was the time. And I have to say, Juliana Pena deserves her respect. Things can happen on December 11th. But all I'm saying is, she isn't booked. And you look at the rest of the contenders, Cynthia Calvillo lost. I think Grasso and Joanne Calderwood could be next if she sticks around at 125. But other than that, there's nothing going on. And I actually think the 125 pound division would, uh, you know, would be best served maybe waiting a little longer so that they can build up some contenders, a little bit of a queue. And so I think the time is now to make this happen. And you heard it there. She says, what did she say? She said she knows that Amanda Nunes was gifted the belt in Edmonton. Very close fight. A lot of people thought that Valentina won that fight, that five-round tightly contested battle back in when? 2017, I do believe, off the top of my head, September of 2017. And so there you go. I've never heard her talk. Maybe she did another interview. I can't say that I've seen every... I've never heard her talk about the fight and the opponent like that before. Consummate pro, you kind of have to work to try to, you know, get the goods out. But that was fascinating stuff, if you ask me. Tremendous stuff. And yes, yes, when they do the countdown show and they want to use... The, the quotes for the genesis of the trilogy, it's on me, my friends. It's on me. Fair use. Have at it. So we'll go from the greatest female flyweight champion of all time to, in a matter of seconds, the greatest male flyweight champion of all time. My old pal, the one and only, this man right here. Thanks to my good friends at uh, MMA Bobblehead, Dave. Look at that. One of the better ones that they have. Look at that beautiful Demetrius Johnson bobblehead. He actually has a really cool toy that is out. I've seen on his Instagram. He hasn't offered it to me just yet, which is a little bit weird. I'm not going to lie. You know, I've been kind of waiting for the, hey, you know, you got your show back. You know, my new toy would look really great on your desk. And uh, I haven't gotten that. So uh, perhaps I will ask him about that as we say hello now. Back on the Zoom machine to the one and only one of the greatest ever, Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. There he is, my old friend DJ. How are you, sir? 
I'm good, Ariel Wani. Congrats, congrats on all your recent success. You got your show back. Wow. I, I was I was watching one of the things you said. You're like, I think it was you and Brandon Schaub going at it. You're oh, like, you like this that. is my own show. That's right. I'm my own shit now. You like that, huh? You like that? A little Hiawani. You like that, DJ? Enough talking shit about Hiawani. I come back after you now. You come at the king. You best not miss. And they all gone quiet. <laughs> How about that? Good for you, man. I'm proud of you. Well, I got a bone to pick with you because I got a lot of toys here, and I see you, uh, you know, you showing off this new toy of yours. I didn't get one. I wasn't even offered one. I mean, I feel like it would look really good on the desk. You know, you know the one I'm talking about. There's like that little mighty guy that I see you. You know, looks kind of like a Funko Pop doll. You know the one I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I know which one you're talking about. I'll send you one once we get off the show. No, like now it doesn't gift, work anymore. It's not out of the kindness of your heart. You don't want to ask for a gift. You want someone to say, hey, I got something for you. It would look great on the desk. Wow. Well, I haven't got none from you. You got this brand new show. I'm sure you got <laughs> fucking stickers. You haven't sent me none yet. I got nothing. I got nothing. To be honest. Who made those? I like those. What company is that? Um, that's YouTube's. So that came from, I was uh, at GameStop one day, and I was like, man, you know what? I really want a Funko Pop. And a lot of streamers, like Dr. Disrespect, to Hatman, they've uh, lyric, they create some of that stuff with uh, YouTube. So I reached out to them and I was like, hey, I would love to do one with you guys. I'm like, absolutely, let's make it happen. And let me design the whole entire thing. And, you know, it, it was a good experience and I loved it. Wow. Okay. Well, it's really cool. Check it out. It's on his Instagram. Um, all right. We have a lot to talk about, DJ. It's been a minute, as the kids like to say. Can we start chronologically, if you don't mind? Oh, there you are. Are you taking a call? Sorry. Oh, now I, you're back. I was trying to turn you up. I was trying to turn you up. Okay, my bad. All right. Um, April, TNT show, Adriana Marais. It was surreal to see you lose like that, you know, because you had been so invincible, and we saw the tight, close loss to, to, to Henry. But like that, it was it was surreal stuff. How did you feel about what happened there in that fight? Like to, to go through that, the emotions that go, you know, everything that goes through a loss like that. How did you digest it? You know, being in the sport for a long time and seeing, like, my favorite fighters lose. You know, I remember when Ronda lost. I remember when, you know, Ben Henderson's lost, Fedor's lost, Krokop's lost. Just a lot of my favorite athletes lose. And I see how devastated they were, how it kind of changed their outlook on things. And I never wanted that to be... Like, I never wanted to, when I see that, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to let that affect me. So, you know, obviously coming up short and getting a TKO'd and finished for the first time in my career, you know, it, it was definitely some that I never experienced about. I think the, the funniest thing I laughed at, and I was like, great. Now when I fell out of the damn application, how you've ever been TKO'd? I was like, God damn it, I have been TKO'd. Yeah. For the longest time, I haven't had to fill that out. So it, it was some experience, but, you know, it, it's part of the game. You, you do the sport long enough, it, it's bound to happen. And, you know, I, I've been, I didn't go out cold, as you can say. Like, I've been knocked out cold from snowboarding. Um, I've been pushed off a roof before where I woke up. I'm like, what the fuck happened? What happened? You pushed me off the roof, didn't you? He goes, no, I didn't. I was like, yes, you did, you son of a bitch. So I've been knocked out, like, cold. But that wasn't, you know, like, uh, I remember the shot that landed. And then I remember I fell on my back and I was like, shit, get up, get up. And I sucked my hand and I underhooked and I was trying to get up. And it was just that perfect opportunity for him to execute that knee uh, when I was trying to get up and he landed it and I felt it. And I felt every shot afterwards. And then once, you know, the ref pulled him off, I was like, God damn it. And he goes, take your time. I was like, I'm fine. Get up. And I got up and went over to congratulate him. And um, yeah, and that's how, that's how it went down. In America, that knee is illegal. Does that, how do you feel about that? And like for the vast majority of your career, that move means you win the fight. Was that strange for you? I know you know what the rule set is, but it's a freaking weird thing. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a weird thing. You know, when I came back home <clears throat> from the fight, a lot of people were like, dude, what the hell was that? I was like, what do you mean? He goes, how can that son of SOB didn't get disqualified? And I was like, it's like, okay, well, one, in, in one championship, that is legal. You can need to ground and put it. And they're like, I didn't ever, you know, my milkman, that's what I was having a conversation with. He goes, I didn't know that. Like, you had the whole house being pissed off. We were like, that's some bitch in the, the squad. By now, I was like, well, it's, it's in one championship. It's, it's, it's legal. You can need to ground and put it. Like, I've never seen that before. So, half the time, I'm explaining to people that, you know, it's legal over there. And then, 
Yeah. And they're like, you never have to experience that. And I told, I told my coach that too. And I was like, you know, you, you, you go through training camp and how often do you get rocked? Right. Not very often because you only suffer concussions or get dropped in training. So when I stuck my arm in there, I've never done it before in my life. Never stuck my arm in there and try to get up that way. Usually you should go to your back or you go to legs, but you know, who, who trains when they're rocked. And it's the first time I've been experienced in that position getting up because I've been dropped before. Dodson has dropped me multiple times in a fight and I'm able to recover and get back in the fight. Um, you know, so, but yeah, it, it's something that it's legal over there and I, I have to get used to it. I found out the hard way, I guess. By the way, you still have a milkman over there in Washington. I thought those went away. Yes, sir. Really? What does he come? He, he drops it off in like the little glass jug. Yeah, he does. Um, come on. Really? It's a, uh, yeah, it's. I think it's Smith Brothers. Yeah, Smith Brothers um, milk, and he drops off eggs too. So we get fresh milk and Come fresh on. eggs every Friday. So he's he's cool, man. He's cool. Oh wow! Yeah, I feel like you live in like uh, Pleasantville in nineteen sixties. I don't see any of that where I live. Wow. That's pretty cool. Good for you. It's a nice life over there. Um, but okay. But do you like it? Do you, I mean, obviously you signed up for it. But like, are you in favor? Because there was a bit of a an irony there. You commented on the Aljamain Sterling knee. And then it happens to you. So, like, are you in favor of this this grounded, you know, opponent knee is okay type of thing? Or would you rather it be more like the U.S.? No, I, I need the guy on their face, too. When um when I fought Yuya Wakamatsu, I was kneeing him. And I, I'm a fan of it because he keeps the fight progressing, right? And that's how I've always been brought up, you know, with my coach. You know, Matt Hume, he's always talked about it. Like, how can a fighter be put in a position where it stops the other athlete from basically pursuing the end goal of the fight? Like, need somebody, right? And that's when you're brought up that since 2009, because Matt's been in pride and, you know, they're kicking people to down an opponent, they're needing people. Like, it keeps the progression of the fight. And so, I know you're trying to get that to you, getting that, you know, with Ajima Stone. Nah. It, like, oh, oh, it was karma. Nah. Karma. But for me, like, <laughs> when I look at fights, I look at fights as an unbiased opinion. Like, I like Ajima Sterling. Don't really know Peter Yan, but I love both their fighting style. And so, as an athlete, I'm sitting here and I'm watching the fight. I'm, I'm sitting here watching the fight, and I'm like, why the, I'm like, Ajima, you're way better than that. You're way fucking better than that. And you're sitting on your hands and knees, and quote, unquote, these are his words. He said, I felt like I was in a safe position. You in a fucking fight, dog. There is no safe position. You cannot be on your hands and knees and hold him like that and expect him to do something. And granted, Peter Yan broke a rule. But as I'm sitting there, it's like the progression of the fight needs to happen. Peter Yan had to self-consciously stop thinking that, oh, I cannot hit you because you're, you're grinding. So let me uh, fix something else out. Like that's, that was my mindset going into that fight. And so, is it karma? I don't believe in karma. I think if I wouldn't have said anything about that me to Asma Sterling ground upon, I'm sure if I was in that position, Adrian Marias would have still blasted me in the face, and that's what happened. Do you think Aljo should have continued? That's up to him. Yeah. You know, I got blasted clean right in the face, and I got up like a man. I was like, man, that was a good ass shot. Yeah. And what about my life? You know, he, his, everybody's different. Everybody takes a shot different. He's got neck problems, so who knows what he was going through in that fight. But he's, he's going to ask man if he wanted to continue. He could have. If he didn't want to, he didn't have to. Now, how much time did you take off from training after something like that? Because it was so new to you, so foreign to you. Did you need some time off or did you, you know, sometimes people get knocked out and they go away. They don't want to train. They want nothing. You know, they, they get depressed. How did you handle it? Oh, I just came home. Nothing for me, nothing ever changes when I win or lose. Right. Because I've, when you have children and you have a life outside of fighting, you know, like I remember after my eighth consecutive title offense, I came home, started washing dishes, started doing laundry, changing diapers. So I've, I've been a father throughout my whole entire career. So even after this loss, um, you know, with the, you know, being a TKO or whatever, came home, started washing dishes, did laundry, took the kids, got my son on his dirt bike. So my life's very, I'm very involved outside of fighting. Uh, and then how long did it take me to get back into the gym? Well, you know, I think two months because things I'm, I'm busy outside of fighting and that's why I've always loved it. I didn't spar for maybe 
probably three months just to just chill. There's no reason to get right back in the gym. You see these guys like, man, I'm going to get right back in the gym and, you know, get back to work. And I'm like, yeah, I, I did that. You know, I've been training nonstop since 2008, 2000 and yeah, 2008. So for me, you know, like I just want to be involved in my children's life and I don't see any rush to get right back in the gym to train. You know, I'm always in shape. I'm always working out in the morning. So yeah, I just chilled. Do you think you would have handled it differently if you weren't a father, if you had no kids, no wife, no nothing, a single guy, and you go back to your house? 1,000%. Okay. 1,000%. Because there's that, I mean, like for me, a lot of athletes, they go away for training camp, right? They go away to isolate themselves. And I've never done that before. And for me, I, I want to be involved in my children's life. You know, this morning, dropped the kids off the of school, went to my daughter's ballet practice. Shit, hell, I was doing the, <laughs> this, and I think this is form one five, four, did my butterfly stretches. Like that's, that's why I train. That's why I fight is to be able to experience that stuff with my children. Like if I, if I wasn't a successful athlete, I'll be working clocking in nine to five. So for me, like I'm grateful to have, you know, my children and my wife, because if I just fought all the time and look for the next fight, next fight, next fight, I'll be bored. Like I, I truly would be bored. By the way, how did your wife handle seeing you get knocked out for the first time? Um, she, you know, I think she was more, uh, the hardest thing is that she's always at my fights, mm. right? So with me being in Singapore and her not being able to be there to console me or whatever, um, she was a little shaken up, uh, shaken up. But once I called her, I was like, hey, baby, she was she okay, baby? I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm back in the hotel room, quarantined again. So, um I'll let you know they let me out. And, and that's it. And, you know, she's been with me since my second amateur fight. And she was there. You know, when I came home, I was like, I got knocked out. She was, we got knocked out. This is when I went snowboarding. She goes, how did you get knocked out? And I was like, I went off a jump and I backseat it. She goes, you can't backseat me. You go off a big jump like that. Maybe you can break your back. And I was like, well, I got knocked out. She goes, well, I don't think she's snowboarding. But I was like, I think you're right. I think you're right. And that's it? You, you've never snowboarded since? Uh, I went somewhere two more times. Then after uh, I injured my ankle, this is when I was getting ready for Uncle Creepy. If I injured my ankle, I was like, I'm done snowboarding. So now when I get a contract signed, I stop all major uh, sports. Okay. Um, and so you take this time off, and then just a couple of weeks ago on this program, Chatri Sichotong oh. comes on and announces this fight that no one saw coming, you versus the Muay Thai legend Rotang in a mixed rules fight, four rounds, one round MMA, then Muay Thai, MMA, Muay Thai, and it's going down December 5th on the 10th anniversary show. How the hell did this come about? <laughs> this is some crazy, well, crazy once stuff. Again, <laughs> once again, your boys at home chilling with the wife, and um, they're like, hey, we want you to fight, uh, we want you to fight for the Muay Thai, Muay Thai bell gets rotting, and I was like, hmm, well, I'm very flattered. Uh, and I want to be honest with you guys. And I said, I don't deserve, I don't deserve a fight for the Muay Thai belt. Like, I understand you guys are trying to do a big fight. You want to, you want to sell the fight, but I'm, I don't deserve that belt. And there's a lot of athletes that spent their whole entire life hoping that one day they can fight for a Muay Thai belt. I'm not a Muay Thai, well, I'm not a world-class Muay Thai fighter. I know that. And I'm okay with that. I, I didn't, you know, dedicate my martial arts to Muay Thai. So I said, uh, I'll, I'll still fight Rod Ting, but it doesn't have to be for, for the Muay Thai belt. Like, let somebody else have that. Like, let somebody else who deserves that get that shot. And I said, we'll still do it. I was like, I'll fight him in big gloves. We can do three threes or whatever. And they said, okay, well, we'll come back to you. And then they came back to me, I think, two days later. And I was like, how about this? And I was like, you know, they're like, special rules fight. First round Muay Thai, second round MMA, third round Muay Thai, fourth round MMA. And I said, okay. Send a contract. Let's make it happen. And that's how I went down. Yeah, okay. And so just to be clear, um, what kind of gloves will you be wearing? MMA gloves? Mixed martial arts gloves. So four ounces. Oh. Like, I think they're four ounces. I feel like they're two ounces. I was just over there and I was getting my buddy James James Yang ready for his fight. And I was sitting there looking at the gloves. I'm like, there is nothing to these gloves. There's like <laughs> it's like a piece of paper on your glove, on your on your uh, your hand. Thinner than the UFC ones? Oh yeah, I think so. Like I, I've, I've played with multiple gloves and I feel like the USC gloves are a little bit thicker, but they also go to right about uh -huh. here uh -huh. to where the, 
Fairtex uh, one chip circles, they kind of go to right here. So it's more of a, it lays down more, if that makes sense. Do you think that uh, prohibits or at least helps prohibit eye pokes because it's a little more curved? No. No, okay. No, no. It's, <laughs> right. the, the natural reaction of somebody when they're backing up is to go like this, mm -hmm. right? Like to go like this. So your fingers are there or, or to measure distance, right? Like when you're in the dark, like if the, all the lights are turned off, nobody walks around like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. You know, we walk around. This is, this is how we feel. So I don't, you know, I, I, even with, you know, my personal, I feel like the best gloves I've ever could, uh, invented was the pride gloves because they were long. You can, you know, if I hold my, I hold my finger like this, like they just, they're just cover the whole hand. So those are my favorite ones. And they're, and they're nice and cushiony. Like if you knock somebody out with pride gloves, you hit hard, mm -hmm. right? Like you hit hard and you can find your shot. How many rounds, uh, excuse me, how many minutes per round is it? Three minutes. Three. And why four? What if it goes 2-2? Two, two? It goes 2-2. Two, two. As for me, we were like, a buddy of mine, he goes, so how does this work? Like, how are they going to score it? And yeah. what happens in the first round, he tears you up. Second round, you take it down. You tear him up. Third round, da 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 I said, to be honest with you, dude, I'm not even worried about that. Like, I'm going out there. I'm going to compete. Like, if they're like, okay, this is an ex exhibition fight or this is a special rules fight, I'm not worried about that. Like, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to compete, train, and go out and fight. And are you going to train specifically in Muay Thai? No, no, no. We'll do, we'll do a lot of Muay Thai clinching, a lot of, you know, balance, working the sweeps. Uh, but we've, we've always trained Muay Thai in our, in our camps, right? Because it's part of mixed martial arts. I have to mix everything up uh, together in a competition. So with this, we will focus a little bit more on the feet, but we're still going to keep doing what we're doing, working on the grappling and the wrestling, everything. Was this even on your radar at all? Did you, did you think like, is this something that would have never crossed your mind had they not brought it to you or in the back of your mind, did you think, Oh, maybe this would be something fun to do one day? Well, obviously I've, I've always wanted to do something like this, you know, when I signed up to one championship, because it's, it's not just based on mixed martial arts. Like right. they don't just focus on that aspect of the sport. They celebrate, you know, they showcase all the sports. So, you know, like I said, I was at home chilling and I'm like, Hey, you want to do this? I was like, let's do it. And I'm grateful for the opportunity and I'm going to go out there and take full advantage of it. Wow. You know, one thing I heard people say in the aftermath, and I'd love to get your response to this was DJ never wanted to do the TJ Dillashaw fight. And now he wants to do this fight. How do you explain that? That you didn't want to do something a little bit out there with TJ, but you're okay to do this. Well, see the whole TJ Dillashaw thing, we, we sent them, we gave our demands if we're going to do a TU Dosha fight, right? And one of the demands was if he couldn't make weight 125, then we get to fight at 125 for his, for his belt. And I think we were going to get some of his purse. And he was, he was like, no, 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 you can't do it. Because I know me being an athlete, I knew when TJ pressed the 135, he's already shredded, already shredded. And I knew if he cut to 125, he couldn't do it healthy. And I, I just knew he couldn't do it. And he's proven that he's made the weight, but he couldn't do it healthy. And he popped for, you know, that fucking EPO drug, whatever he was doing. And I talked to him about it too. He was like, dude, you know, I wanted it so bad. And that's one thing I, I respect TJ, right? Because I saw him at Disneyland. I was walking, I bumped him. I was like, what's up, cuz? <laughs> Talking all that shit. Talking about, like, I said, what? I said, why'd you say those bad things about me? He goes, man, you know how it is, man. I'm trying to sell fight. And I was like, I've never said anything bad about you, TJ. You should have said that. His wife, Becca, was there. And, you know, Becca and Destin were talking. And I think they're, they're there with their, their little boy. But I was like, damn, dog. I was like, why'd you do it? He was like, dude, I wanted to make 125 so bad. And when I was cutting down to, you know, try to, I would wake up every morning, I'd just be exhausted. And, you know, so I started taking this stuff. And it just helped me, you know, bounce back. So I, I give him respect by him just being straight up. It was, you know, man to man, running the middle of Disneyland, and he told me that. But that's what we said. Like, I knew he wasn't going to be able to make the weight class um, healthy and be able to perform. And that's what we put in the contract to fight TJ. And they're like, no, that's not going to happen. I was like, okay, the fight's not going to fucking happen. So a lot of people don't understand what goes on in the back yeah. in the back door. Like, you know, the, the mat, the matchmaker or the CEO of the organization is going to, you know, Oh, he doesn't want to do the fight. 
okay, it's like John Jones. Like, everybody's like, oh, well, John Jones is going to fight him. John Jones wants more money. So he's, he wants to fight him. He just wants to get paid more. Doesn't mean he doesn't want to fight him. So, By the way, when was that meeting at Disneyland? How long ago? Oh, that was a long time. I mean, shit, I think we're both, I think I was still in the UFC. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and it was like a meeting. We just bumped into yeah, each other. Yeah, he's yeah, having yeah. dinner with his wife. And, and um, I just said, what's up? And started chopping it up. By the way, since you brought him up, uh, could I ask, what do you make of this latest John Jones situation? <sighs> you know, I want the best for John Jones, him and his family. Um, and, you know, I, I think he, he said it best. You know, he has a lot of demons about the alcohol and hopefully he can get past that and, you know, be a good role model for, you know, all the children and all the dads out there and, and for his daughter. So wish him, wish him nothing but the best. And we've always had great interactions with each other each time we worked with each other. So, yeah, it's just it's just unfortunate and, and sad. And, yeah. You have reached a point now, DJ, uh, where your peers are starting to retire. Uh, you mentioned Uncle mm -hmm. Creepy. That was a while ago. Joseph Benavidez very recently. Uh, Dotson is kind of, you know, uh, slowly, you know, calling it a career. And you're still around. What is it like to see the guys that, you know, you cut your teeth with, the, your, your peers? Like, those were the guys, right, who made the flyweight division, among others as well. Now starting to trickle away, and you're still around. What is that like? Uh, it's definitely interesting because I remember watching Joseph when I was working full time at Carastar during his WC days. And I've always said this, you can't fight forever. Right. And I, I think, you know, that's just showcasing that like Joseph retiring, you know, John, John Dodson kind of going, he's, he hasn't officially retired, but he hasn't been as active. Yeah. I know him and his family just had a, you know, a whole bunch of accident, but I, I'm happy they're okay. But it, it's, it's the journey of an athlete, right? Because I know there's going to come a day where I'm like, I'm done. Like, there's nothing left for me to prove. Financially, I'm stable. I want to be home. I want to help time more his dirt bike and his motocross. So I know it's going to happen. And I've always had that mindset that when I'm done fighting, the transition should be smooth. I shouldn't wake up like, man, I need to... I missed the bright lights. I missed this, this, this. I want to be like, I'm done. I, I, I've experienced that. So we see Joseph and those guys move on with their life. Like I'm excited for what they do next. And yeah, when it's time for me to walk away from the sport, you know, I'll be, I'll be ready and I won't have any regrets. How far away are we from that? And did the loss in April expedite that? No, it doesn't. I've always viewed my career as a job. Right. Like I remember I, I sat down and listened to Joseph Benavides, uh interview with Chris Weidman on his, his podcast. And I always viewed my career as a job. And somebody asked me why. And I said, well, when I started working as a kid, you know, I worked to provide for, to have a car. My mom was like, you want a car, baby? You better take your ass down the street and work at parking putters and start making your $5 an hour. And I was like, okay, we'll go do that. Started sweeping court, sweeping the golf course. When I worked in, you know, high school, working at Taco Bell graveyard shift to pay for my my car insurance, that, that's what I did. Uh, so now, you know, me fighting at, at, in my career, there's two sides of me. There's a side of when I step in the gym, I'm focused, I'm moving, I, I'm in my element. You know, I forget about time, I forget about everything, and I, I enjoy fighting it. And when I'm at home, I'm thinking like, okay, so we got this. I want to set up this for Times College, Tennis College, Mavericks College. Time wants this. I want to be able to chill. How am I going to get there? By competing and making money. So that's what I'm going to do. So once I get to the point where I don't need all that stuff, I don't need to compete anymore. So people look at us like, oh, you're just doing that because you need this. I'm like, I can go work at Costco, but it won't be the exact same pay. So <laughs> why don't I do something I'm really good at? And I love it. I'll be able to do that instead. So for me, once I get to that point, then I'm like, okay, I'm good. Or if injuries or if I'm getting, you know, you know, knock on wood, my ACL, my neck, my back, my hips, everything feels great. So if injuries take me out sooner, then, then so be it. But I'm going to go to, I'm like, okay, I, I, I got all my ducks in a row as Marshall Lynch, count your chickens or save your chickens, whatever he said. That's that's why. So I view it as a job. This is my job, and I love it. You know, every personality is different, but it seems like the moment you are done, you will be able to transition. You won't be one of those guys 
who comes back in five years because they need the money and it's sad and everyone's having those conversations about you. I mean, look, we saw it with Nick Diaz. Let's not beat around the bush. We don't know what his motives are, but like that wasn't the Nick Diaz of old. I don't think we'll ever see that. You're obviously a completely different person. But if you could give a young fighter advice right now, what is it? To not have to do that, to not be the sad story in their 40s, to not be broke, because let's be honest, in MMA, you don't make as much money as boxing, and we see a lot of these guys hanging on when they shouldn't. What is the advice? How did you figure this out to be ready to go away and be comfortable unlike so many others? Uh, I ran out to my coaches. You know, I, I remember when I was fighting in the WC, I remember dinner, I was like, all right, WC 48, first time on uh, pay-per-view. He's like, all right. I'm going to give Fighter Night $65,000. And I was like, $65,000? I'm about to buy me WRX. I'm about to buy my dream car. And I remember Matt, he turned around, he goes, you're going to buy a house. You're going to invest. And ever since that point, ever since that first fight, all my title fights, all that stuff, you know, I've never been very, I should say stupid with my money. I've always been smart with it, investing in it. And that's, you know, because they always tell me, you can't fight forever. Like, I remember after I lost my first title fight, you know, and that was like, I think she goes to school. I was like, I ain't going to fucking school, man. I was like, I'm going to fight till girls fall off. And I, 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 have no, I have no reason to go to school. I don't want to get education. I want to keep up competing. So I've had a great support group around me. And I think for the young fighters, you have to, I always tell them, what's your end goal, right? Like one of my coaches breakfast, and he said, what's your end goal, DJ? Like, what's your angle? And I was like, should I ever have to work everything in my life? You know, it's okay. So when you get to that point, that's what you should be striving for. It's to never have to work for ever again in your life. So I tell young athletes, you get into mixed martial arts, okay? One, save your money because you the money you're making now, it's not going to be the same when you get older. Two, support yourself. Uh, support yourself. Your group needs to be somebody you trust and that want the best interest for you, right? And... Enjoy the journey and just save save your money. And always look at what's your end goal. Why did you start fighting? Is to be a world champion? Gucci, right? My my goal when I started fighting was never to be a world champion because, it, it, one, it wasn't attainable because there was no weight class for me. Two, I just did it because it was something to do after I got home from work and it was a great way to stay in shape. And it was a patch on right? And it turned out to be a great career. So... Yeah, save your money, Support, uh, surround yourself with great people who want the best interest of you, and yeah, man, just, you know, enjoy it, enjoy the journey. What a mensch you are, DJ. Unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you know what that term means, but that means you're an absolute gentleman. Uh, and uh, you are, you are, you were like you, I, I said this about Carlos Condit um, when he retired. I kind of have this uh, survivor's guilt now a little bit because there was a group of guys and and females who were kind of coming up when I came into this sport too as a journalist. Mm -hmm. And I feel a kinship to you guys, you and Carlos Condit and GSP and all these guys. And to see you guys, you know, slowly start to retire, not say that you're going to retire anytime soon, but you know what I mean? Like, I, I will never feel the same way about the guys from 2010 to 2020. If I'm doing this sport in 60, it, it won't be the same. The guys in 2040 or whatever, God willing, I'm still doing this. And so I just have a lot of love for you guys, a lot of respect for you guys. And I wish you guys the best. And, uh, you know, I will admit, maybe I'm not supposed to say this. It bummed me out when I saw you get knocked out. You know, we're not supposed to root for people. We're journalists. We're unbiased. But... You know I love you, and uh, I'm happy to hear you're okay, and I can't wait for this fight on December 5th, 1X, you versus Rotang, a, a dream fight, if you will. So good luck in training for this uh, very unique bout. Thank you for the time, as always. I know you don't love doing these interviews, but I feel like we've come a long way. You used to not even want to do them on camera back in the day, and now look at us doing them on Zoom from your kitchen. It's a beautiful thing. I know, man, and I appreciate all the love, and you've always been a big supporter of my career, and yeah, man. I enjoy doing these interviews with you because it, it, you're very straightforward and I always have to be transparent too. And yeah, I most appreciate your support and yeah, I'll get that toy to you. I apologize. All right, all right. Yeah. That that's just, you. that's just me buttering you up for the toy. That's basically what all that was. So you really don't want the damn toy. <laughs> no, no, I do. I was buttering you up to get the toy because <laughs> I needed the toy on my desk. Cause it's pretty sweet. This Roy McDonald one is probably my favorite. Um, it's the, I forget who did it, but anyway, that would be up there with one of the best. It's a really nice one. DJ, you're the man. Thank you very much. Good luck. And we'll talk to you soon. That's good. I'll get it towards Steve. All right. There he is. Mighty mouse, Demetrius Johnson, the legend, December 5th. Looking forward to that fight. Uh, very much. 
against a fellow legend. I'm not a huge Muay Thai guy, but I know who Rod Tang is, and uh, that's a pretty unique thing. Again, it's uh, one round Muay Thai, one round MMA, one round Muay Thai, one round MMA. Four rounds, three minute rounds, supposedly four ounce gloves. I mean, what a scene that's going to be. What a scene that is going to be. All right. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to our next guest. Our next guest may not be a household name just yet here in America, but he is a massive star in France. Dare I say, he is one of the most popular fighters in France, just as popular, believe it or not, as Francis Ngannou, Czech Congo, Cyril Gann, the French prince. Uh, he will be competing for the interim Cage Warriors featherweight title on Friday. They're having their trilogy series again, so it's going to be uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all in London. Um, as I said, massively popular. He's a former Cage Warriors champion. He's going up against a very um, skilled and entertaining fighter from Ireland named Paul Hughes. Bit of a rivalry there. But uh, over the last couple of years, our next guest has turned into a massive star and has a fascinating backstory. And so I'm really excited to welcome for the very first time to this program, the last pirate, Morgan Charrière, to the show. He joins us now via the magic of Zoom. Morgan, mon ami, merci beaucoup, ça va? Ça va parfaitement, merci. Uh, vous savez pas que je parle français? Très bien, vous parlez super bien français. Merci, uh, je viens de Québec, c'est pas la même chose que la France, le français est un peu différent, mais uh, j'ai beaucoup de respect for, pour les, uh, les français uh, mixed martial fighters. Uh, I will stop there, Morgan, because I can't do much yeah. more, it's a little rusty. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, thank you for doing this, my friend, and I know you just uh, got to London not that long ago, so I appreciate you jumping on right after the flight. Yeah, thank you to, uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm really happy to be there, so no problem. Okay, Morgan, okay for me. you know, I have to say, um, around a year or so ago, I used to see Cage Warriors and uh, UFC Fight Pass, the Twitter account, tweeting these pirate emojis. And every time they would tweet it, it, the engagement was crazy, like, you know, multiple thousand likes and all these comments. And I was like, what is going on here? Who is this guy that they keep tweeting about? And that, you know, it's not just like 10 likes, 20 likes. It's like a huge explosion every time it's it's uh, tweeted, that pirate emoji. And then I find out it's you, and I learn more about your backstory, and your backstory is great. So I hope uh, you're okay with answering some questions about your backstory, because this is very interesting to me. You were just a fighter, and you were doing your thing, and then you... You teamed up with a Twitch star, a YouTube star, right? And that changed everything for you. Would that be would that be accurate? Yeah, definitely, yes. Okay, so this young yes. man's name is Kameto? Yes, Kameto. So it's the famous Twitch uh, guy in France. It's like I think in the top three in France. And uh, you, guys. you guys put together a show called Plus Jamais Gros, which means in English, yes. like never you'll never be big basically he was a big kid yeah. who needed to lose some weight how did you team up with him how did that happen uh so it was we uh, on twitter so i was on twitter like maybe it's been a, a long time ago i'm on twitter like maybe eight years i don't know since i'm a kid i'm on twitter so i'm just i was doing my thing uh talking about sport mma coaching thing like that to you know just grow uh, the people who were following me and uh, earning some money with selling some sport program and stuff like that. And so one day, um, Kameto started following me. So I see a guy who has a lot of followers follow me and I'm like, who is this guy? Because I don't know, uh, I wasn't, um, I had no knowledge about Twitch, about the stream game. So I was like, who is he? Is this guy? He was like with... 110,000 followers, I was like, wow, he's so big. And so, and I see some of his friends follow me too. And I'm like, why, why <laughs> all of these guys are following me right now? And so he sent me a, a, a private message and, and he says to me, um, hi Morgan, I'm looking to lose some weight. Can you send me a, a, a sport program? Because uh, on Twitter, I uh, was uh, a bit famous about the sport. But I was uh, doing a lot of things to promote sport, you know, to make the people move, to do things, not especially martial art, but just move, lose some weight, be good in, in, uh, in your life. 
So he saw me, he saw my Twitter pass and he asked one of his friends, do you know this guy? He said, yeah, it's an MMA fighter, a French MMA fighter who's really good. And, he, and so he asked me, can you, can you make me a sport program? So I tell him, no, I, I will not send you a sport program because you will follow it like maybe one week and you will stop like everybody and you will never lose uh, your weight. But if you want, we can do something. I tell you, I can come to your home and I can train you for one month. Uh, just when I come, uh, you pay me to, you pay, uh, how to say it, you, you pay me to, um, for me, I'm to let me able to not lose money, but I'm not here to earn money. Yep. I was just here to help me, help him, help him. But uh, I did not, uh, did not want it to come for free and lose my client just because he's a, a star. So uh, we, we, he say, okay, you, you can come, but I, I don't know him and, and he don't know me. He say, you can come. I say, okay, I, I come in two days. I'm at your home. And I, at, and I tell him, uh, it's okay for you if I come with my, uh, my poopy. He said, yeah, okay, no problem. So I come with my poopy, my, uh, my luggage. And today after I'm, I'm with him. And I, so just before I come, I, I tell him, uh, listen, I'm an MMA fighter. So I think communication and engagement is really important. I can help you for free, but we need to do something big to motivate people. And if I can help you, you can help me too. So we do a win-win situation. It's like we'll do, we will do a, a web series on YouTube. So I had in my mind the, the, the show Extreme Fat Loss. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know if you see. Yeah, of course. Show. Extreme weight loss. Yeah, so, yeah. So I, I had in my mind, I was like, okay, there are big show in the United States. They do it like this. We can do some, something like that. Like, uh, we, we, we make, uh, on YouTube, everyone to look, oh, we lose weight, but we don't, um, we tell the truth. It's like, if you don't lose weight, we'll tell them why you don't lose weight because you didn't do it. And he was telling his feelings about uh, obesity, what he had to do all his life to to uh, to get confident, to be able, and a lot of things. So we did it in like in summer. So everyone was looking at it like a web series. Like we do two show uh, a week. So everybody was waiting one show after one show after one show. And we put some, um, some, uh, how to say it, some, uh, I don't know how to say it. Sorry. Say it in but French. This was like, okay, uh, this objective. Oh, you, you had some, uh, you know, you had some goals. Yeah, some goals uh, in the show. It was like, okay, if you want Camel to do uh, 100 kilometer tomorrow, uh, I need to gain uh, 5,000 followers. <laughs> you know? It was uh, things like that. Yeah. And so we, are, we, were, we don't know what to expect. So we were like, okay, maybe I will get 1,000 people. And that's cool. It's okay for me because we, 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 we were just trying to do some, something. But no, it was like crazy off the roof. 20,000 followers starting to come on the first show. 1 million views on YouTube on the first first video and we were like, whoa, what have we done right here? Yeah. And so we have done this for one month. Uh, we have trained a lot. We have done a lot of things. Uh, we have achieved, achieved a lot of goals. Uh, Kamel lose about um, uh, 15 kilos. I think it's like 55 uh, no, pounds, kilos. 55 pounds or something yeah, like it's that. Like, yeah, like this. Yeah. So it's huge for one month. Yeah. It's a big guy. So you can see it like you you see the beginning of the show and the end is like all skinny. You're like, oh, whoa. And so and with my on my Instagram, I was doing story of uh, what we were doing on the day. So when I wake up him because he was a streamer. So he go to bed really late, like at six o'clock of the morning. And I was like, okay, you need to be up at 11 ah. tomorrow, 11 a.m. And I was like, if you don't get up, I'm going to take <laughs> you. And it's like, and every morning he wasn't, uh, he wasn't um, able to wake up himself. So I was going in his room and I was throwing things at him, water, my dog. And, wow. uh, and everybody was loving to, to see this. So uh, we started to do a lot of things like that. But, you know, it was not... 
something to sell something to the people or try to to uh, to not tell the truth it was really like we were documenting a journey to lose weight and you everybody could do it it was like i was explaining a simple fact like you need to eat good but you are not uh, um you do not must uh, like eat uh, one tomato one apple and just this uh, it's like i was like you can eat whatever you want but you need to eat mindfully you need to do sport every day if you can and i was just showing all um, all of these guys not just Kamel but all of his community uh, that they can do it even if they play a lot of things like you just have to do 45 minutes uh, in your day of musculation or cardio or whatever you can do a boxing you can do what you like just move right and so that's what what i was doing with Kamel was never done any sport and everybody f- started to feel like okay it, it seems like Kamel is getting really good. He seems like he's a better streamer now because he's doing some sport. And so we are doing a lot of things. I, I can't tell you how much thing we have done, but it was a, a great moment in my life. And so a big community started to follow me because they liked me, what I proposed, uh, what I was doing with Kamel. Kamel is now one of my big friends. Uh, we really like each other, it's not just business, business. It's really like... The first day we met, we were like, we we're like, okay, what's, that's good between us. We we can communicate really good. There was no issue. We were really laughing. So that's why people started to really engage with me. And if, at the beginning of the show, we tell the thing like this. I helped Car- Carmel to lose weight. You helped me to make so much noise that UFC cannot <laughs> look... Uh, Further than if I'm not here when they come to France, that's bad, really right. bad. Well, it uh, seems that's to have, play. it seems to have worked out. I mean, I look at some of the videos. 1.8 million views on these videos. It seems like it was hugely popular, um, and and it has changed your life. Are so you guys are still buddies? Is he still working out? Everything? Uh, yeah, he's healthy. Yeah. No, it, he's not. No, he's come not on. No. <laughs> what? When I leave because we are we were living uh, together, and oh. when I leave. He's like, okay, I'm good. Oh, so man. I need to come back, to come back, give him some, let's go, let's train. So right now he live uh, near me. So sometimes I pop up uh, at his house, I wake him up and I say, let's go, we, we go train. But yeah, if I'm not on his back, he, he like to, you know, don't go training, but he's a streamer, you know, he never had uh, really, uh, this is in his life. So it's really hard to lose uh, as much weight uh, as he has. So it's really more a mindset than just training. So I'm just here to to make you understand that you just need to train uh, like three, four, four days maybe in the weeks. But I don't want him to be a super athlete like I am. Just want him to move, and he will lose if he start see if he keep moving, itching good. But it's a, a slow process, really slow process. So did, we will get it. Really. Did that video series get you signed by Cage Warriors? No, 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 <laughs> really no. Uh, I had a, um, uh, sorry, um, how to say it? Uh, you can say it in French. I can help you out. Uh, a short notice fight. Ah, yeah. Yeah, against Soren Bach. I was in, uh, yeah, I was in, uh, in Ireland at, at this moment with uh, Coach Cavana, and I was training and doing something. And so uh, my manager called me and said, okay, you can have a short notice fight in Cage Warrior against uh, Soren Bach. For the featherweight title, I was like, oh, okay. But it's in 10 days. Uh. I'm like, okay, I will try to make the weight. And then uh, I had my first shot at uh, the Cage Warrior. And uh, they signed me right after after the fight. I, I did an amazing fight, so they signed me. So, and and uh, obviously it was uh, a fight that you lost, but it was very close. And I think you, you gained a lot of respect yeah. after that fight. And then you went on a roll, and then yeah, you right. win the belt. And then you yep. you fight Jordan Vucinic and you lose a, a controversial split decision. Do you think that if you win that fight, you'd be in the UFC already? Um, I don't know. Maybe they they will uh, they, they will have uh, let me do one more defense to be you know in the plan like they, when they come in France, so everything will be perfect. 
I think this should, would be more have been the story if uh, my belt would, uh, would not have been taken away. And how did you feel? It, it felt like this was the fight where you were coming off all this uh, publicity and a lot more people were starting to recognize you and then you get this title fight after winning the belt and a very controversial split decision. I know your fans were very upset. They felt like you were robbed of the belt. How do you feel about what happened and that judge's decision? Uh, I feel the same. I'm uh, uh-huh. my fan as, uh, as a lot of people. It's like, uh, obviously, I watched the fight, and if I lose, okay, it's okay, I lose. I get to the next scene, I go at Trent, and, and I do another fight. But this time, it was like, at the end of the fight, I was like, why? Why did I lose? I didn't know because I was for me and for not just me, like some judge uh, scored the fight after and they sent me their scorecard. They were like, no way you lose uh, this fight. So it was harder for me to, to accept this. But, you know, it's the life, it's the game. So sometimes a shitty, shitty decision happens. So I just have to keep uh, moving forward, keep winning and everything will be good. How do you feel about Jordan? Because you guys were supposed to rematch, and then he withdrew from the fight, and now you're fighting for the interim belt. How do you feel about this guy? Uh, I have nothing about him. You know, he's a, he's a good guy. He's a fighter. He's a, he has a good level. But he, I would prefer had to have a, my rematch than go on an attempt title fight, do an unification bout, and then defend the belt. Like it's really put so much time. Right. Again, to to regain the position I was, so. You but, feel like it's like, delayed things a little bit. Yeah, that that's definitely the way I delay I delay everything. But you know, it's not all right. So I have time. I'm young. Uh, when when Bellator came to Paris, um, and you know they got to the uh, the the country first before the UFC, did they call you? Because you would have been a perfect guy to be on that card. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think they, they called my, my manager, but, but you know, uh, I'm not for the moment uh, focused on Bellator. I'm not focused on winning everything in Cage Wire. At this moment, I was like, no, I don't want to be part of the Bellator show in France. It was with the COVID, so you could have just half of the people. Yeah. Even uh, just before the show, is, uh, there would be like just, I think, 1,000 1, people that were accept in the in the house. I was there. I, I was uh, looking the uh, the fight. So I was like, no, if I fight in France, me, I will full capacity. I, I need the full capacity. I can blow the roof of any any kind of, kind of neighbor st- stadium. Uh, I can I can sell the full ticket. Um. So, I, like, I just waiting this so I can do it with Cage Wire. Is it accurate to say that you're more popular than Francis Ngannou and Cyril Gan in France right now? Are you more popular than them? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I like yeah. it. I like Definitely. it. No yeah. question. No <laughs> question. <laughs> now I will not be the Amber guy and say no. I say no. Really. Uh, in, in this term, I'm really more mainstream than them. Uh, 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 everybody at my age know me. Uh, some guys. Um, with um, experience, like everybody know me in MMA, at out of MMA for mm-hmm. but Francis and Ganu single game are more for the poor guys who really look uh, into MMA. It's like me; you can see me everywhere because right. I'm, I'm on YouTube. I'm I'm with YouTube star, all of these guys. So I attract a lot of people, a lot of media. I'm on big platforms, so yeah, I'm more famous than them, but. Sergan is now a UFC champ and for Sergan too. So I think we're yeah. saying like this more. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, and so, all right. So what I like about you is that you understand the sort of promotion part of the game. You you understand how to sell yourself. The I mean, just what you laid out there with the uh, the Twitch star. It's very clear that you understand how to sell yourself and get over. Uh, another thing that I like about you is your walkout. Your walkout is very interesting, and you always wear this uh, mask. Um, when you walk out and you, you, you wear it, you know, in, in photos and stuff, we have a picture of you wearing the mask here for those that don't know. What does that mask represent? Uh, that mask represents the, the pirate, you know, that's, that's my, um, my logo. Can I say this? Yeah. yeah. It's my logo. So, uh, it's been like a long time ago, like six, seven years ago, maybe I was uh, working with a graphic and I was telling him, okay, I like, um, uh, one piece. 
saw the the, man, the manga with Luffy and, and things like that. And I was like, okay, I want to do a logo that with the hat, but not really the same, but, and I want a school. And then so I, I started to draw something and then I sent it to him and I say, do you think it could look like me a little? And so I was working with our, an amazing graphic who's called Ove and he started to draw the thing and then it started to be my logo. I said, okay, that's really nice. And so like last year, maybe I found out uh, a guy who do a, a mask uh, for um, cinema. So for the cinema, for the movie, mm-hmm. for the movie, he do, he do the stuff. So he do the, the keys, the, all the stuff, the weird stuff that you can show the head cut or thing like that. So I get in touch with him and I ask him, can you do a mask for me? And he said, yeah, you can. So he, he did this mask for me with my logo, the same one, uh, just for me, one exemplary. Uh, and that's it. That become, uh, I think the, if you go to the power, UFC, yeah. you got to wear that mask. Oh, of course. Okay. Of course. I mean, Sometimes they don't let I you wear that. that stuff. I mean, they let Brian Ortega wear his mask, but he's fighting for the belt. You make your debut, you better be wearing that mask. No, I think they, they will understand. They will okay. look. They will look and they say, okay, you can. And by the way, why The Last Pirate? Where did that come from? Uh, because uh, it's, soon, it's soon better than just the pirate first. And then the last pirate, because I'm the only and the last one that they will elbow, uh, every way member. It's like after me, if there are another pirate, they will say, you, you're copying this guy. So I'm the last one. Okay. It could be just me. What's up with you and Paul Hughes? It seems like you guys don't like each other. Is that true? Uh, no, for me, there's nothing. Uh, he, he made himself uh, alone. It's like... Uh, He's just talking about me, talking, 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 but I don't know. I never talked to him. So he's the only who has rival, rival issues with me. It's like, I don't think I'm on the same level uh, as him or anywhere, anyone else in Cage Warriors. Like, I'm in my own league. And they try to keep it up with me, to to get interaction with me, to gain some some eyes on them because I'm the, the big one, the, the guy who has a lot of engagement, a lot of followers. So... They, they think if the, they talk trash about me, I will get mad and everybody will start to interact with them and they will get, have a fight. They will have a fight for the bed and like that. So it's been maybe two years that he's calling me out, uh, saying trash shit about me and like that. But you know, this is the mental game, but I'm used to this because I have so much follower that people hate me already. Mm-hmm. So I know what it is, guy trying to get my, my, my attention. So... I really don't give a... I will you don't give a crap. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. I don't give a crap about him or about things like that. It's like, I'm just doing my stuff. I'm here to fight with this guy, full guy. Uh, I'm here for the fighting, for the show, for the fun, for things like that. But I don't have time for negativity to talk to with people. It takes so much energy out of me, but I have so much work to do, you know it's really a work to, to have this much uh, follower engagement. It's like not just you are a follower and you do nothing. It's like uh, I put content, I work, uh, uh, I, I have some business uh, aside. Uh, it's like uh, I'm not just uh, uh, the average MMA fighter. Uh, I want to build something really big. I want to make the sport move in France. So I'm trying my best to educate people to do things. So, you know, the hateful people or the guy like him that talk trash about me, I don't see it. I don't look at it. I have too much notification on my phone to see <laughs> what he says. Uh, <laughs> and, so, and, and will this air on TV in France on like a big channel or something? Where, where can people watch us in France? Yeah, yeah. In France, they are watching Cage Wire well on uh, six play, six play, uh, dot, uh, fr. So it's a big channel who who is a um, book with uh, M6. M6. Okay. So it's a big channel in France. Uh, it's like we have six big channels, uh, public channel that you can watch for free. And so the Cage Warrior is on free on the website uh, Six Play. People can watch it on Friday. Every time I fight, they have the, the right to to my fights. So every time I fight, every people can look for free on Six Play and they do so much audience. 
is like the first time they had uh, the right. There were one million people looking wow. to be fighting because they were not not looking uh, for other one uh. or other French fighter. Or me, well, I'm sure one hundred percent they were looking for me. So there were one million people looking uh, for me on six play. Who is not like on TV? You put your TV. It's like this guy had to take their computer or phone, go on six play, create an account, and watch the fight. So there are one million people who wow. did this to watch me. That is impressive, my friend. So the goal is uh, you win on uh, on Friday, and then you fight Jordan, and then maybe UFC. Maybe this time next year yeah. we're in the UFC. Yeah, definitely. I hope uh, they will not come in France in February. Like we st- we start to hear, I prefer if they came later. And so I mean, and it's perfect. All right. Well, I wish you the best, my friend. Great to meet you. Uh, merci beaucoup. Great bon courage, uh, mon ami. Merci. I look forward to it very much. And uh, congratulations on all your success. It's it's really cool to see Thank someone you. become so popular outside of the UFC. It doesn't happen very often these days. And so uh, I think you deserve a lot of credit for what you've been able to do in a short amount of time. So congratulations and good luck on Friday. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to have me on the show and see you soon. All right. There he is, the last pirate, Morgan Charrier. Again, I know maybe not a, a household name here, but these are the interviews that I love. Uh, I remember there was once uh, a Cage Warriors champion who came on this show back in February of 2013, who I think uh, turned out to be pretty good and pretty popular. Uh, of course, I'm talking about Conor McGregor. He is a very popular fighter, and I think that um, perhaps early in his career, he was uh, kind of finding himself, but these days looking very good and was on a bit of a roll. And... Uh, Stumbled against uh, Vucinet uh, back in in March. Was supposed to rematch him in June. Fight got canceled, and now he's going to be fighting Paul Hughes, uh, who is a uh, a talent outside, uh, coming from excuse me, coming from um, fighting out of Northern Ireland, born in Sydney. He is seven and one as a pro, and so that goes down on Friday, one of three Cage Warriors cards. That will be going down on Friday. So much going on in the world of MMA uh, the next few days between uh, Cage Warriors 127, Cage Warriors 128 on Friday. That's the one headlined by Hughes and Charrier. And then Cage Warriors 129, you got Bellator 267 on Friday afternoon on Showtime. You even have a CFFC card on, uh, on Saturday as well. And, of course, UFC on Saturday night beginning at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN+. Plus, Some names on the prelims that you may have heard of, of course, uh, Betch Coher, we love Betch, against Carol Hossa, Casey O'Neill, who I spoke of earlier, against Antonina Shevchenko, the uh, the sister of one Valentina Shevchenko, Jared Gordon, Jamie Malarkey, Devontae Smith. Uh, those are some of the names on the prelims. Main card is a solid one, headlined by Tiago Santos and Johnny Walker. Uh, big fight at 205. Kyle Dacus against Kevin Holland. Remember, we had Kevin Holland on the show a few weeks ago, and he's going to have Johnny Hendricks in his corner. And so we'll see how much the wrestling has improved, if you'll need the wrestling. Uh, Alex Oliveira against Nico Price promises to be a very fun fight. Misha Serkinov against Christoph Djotko. Macy Chason against Aspen Ladd. Good to see uh, Aspen Ladd back in action. And Alex Hernandez against Mike Breeden. Uh, not to be confused with Mike Breen, the ESPN slash ABC NBA commentator. So uh, last guest of the day. Afterwards, we'll get our picks from our good guy, uh, GC, our man GC, our resident betting expert, and also answer some questions that have been left for me on uh, arielhawani.substack.com. Let us go back one final time to the Zoom machine and say hello to our final guest of the day, one of the most uh, popular and entertaining fighters in the light heavyweight division, the one and only Johnny Walker, kind enough to join us. Johnny, how are you, my friend? Thank you for the time. Of course, I'm doing really good. How are you doing, Ariel? I'm doing great. It's good to have you on the show and uh, very excited for this fight against Tiago Santos. I saw just, uh, I think it was yesterday, you posted a picture, Johnny, of uh, yourself pretty much wearing nothing. 
you appear, we have the photo right over here. You appear to be in phenomenal shape, Johnny. I mean, would you say this is the best shape that you've ever been in? Not yet. I can do better. Man. You, you could do better than this? Of course. Okay, so what is the secret to this kind of shape that you're in right now? Sir, it's a lot of focus, commitment of my career, invest so much time, nutritionist, training, sleep, repeat, good nights of sleep, recovery. I'm living like a champion, so I look like a champion now. You do. Um, were you not always doing those things in the past? Not really, you know. Now I'm more, more mature, you know. No, I, I committed to myself more, so I invest 100% of my time now. Before, I was like a boy. Now I'm a man. Interesting. Okay, and, uh, you know, when you say that, it makes me think of maybe some of the dancing and the things that you've done in the past. Does that mean you are not going to do that anymore? No, this is Johnny Walker, man. Okay. Johnny Walker is always be here. It's just more commitment, you know, more responsible, more focus and more serious stuff on my own personal life, on my career, on my training, on my schedule, my habits. Like now I live like a champion, you know? But I'll, I'll be like the crazy motherfucker walk a jumper and anytime. <laughs> you need me? So you'll still do the dancing and the celebrating and all that stuff? Of course, my friend. You have to celebrate. You just live once. You have to make it the most of this life. Even if it means getting injured? No injured more. No. I have to be smart now, you know? I, man I, man I, I manage myself better now, you know? Um, so as far as like, the dedication and being more mature and the schedule and, uh, you know, just the commitment to being in that kind of shape. What changed for you? Like, what made you think it's time for me to take this up a notch? I just grow up a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. I be more serious about my career. I committed to myself and I find a, a good girl, you know, a good coach, good people around me. I make my circle of people better, you know, with more quality. And I just follow the, the right path that God writes for me. As far as your training is concerned, uh, over the last few years, you've been a, a bit of a nomad, and now you have ended up at SBG in Ireland, right? How long have you been there? Probably two years. Okay. Yeah. And do you feel like this is the final stop? I'm a walker, my friend. But yeah, I settled down there. there with my gear, with my coat. But of course, I'm a walker. I have to walk around the world. I'm a walker. Uh -huh. That is my home now. I'm going to be training there. I'll do a lot of my camp training. But I, I like to go to Russia to see my brother. My brother is there now. He's a professional MMA fight heavyweight. You know? So I miss my brother. I have to go to Russia to see him. Train a little bit west and see my friends there. I have to go to Brazil, see my family as well. I want to keep walking around. But Ireland is my home now. So you live in Ireland. You don't just train there. You actually live there. Yeah, I live there. Okay, and your brother lives in Russia? Yeah, he, I left him in Russia because my last company training against uh, Corey Anderson, I make in Russia, right? Yeah. When I leave to fight, and he stayed. So he now he have a wife, he have a little daughter. Oh, no. Field. Now he's a Russian guy. He met, a, he met a Russian girl? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And did you meet an Irish girl? Yes. Oh my gosh, you guys are crazy. That's amazing. You know, take over the world, man. <laughs> uh, and what is his name? We need to look out for him. Walter uh, Ignacio, or Clean Monster. Walter Ignacio, Clean Monster. Walter? Walter, yeah. Is it W A L T E R? Uh, v. V A L T E R. Okay, and what's his nickname? Clean Monster. Clean Monster? What does that mean? <laughs> because he's big, he's taller than me a little bit, okay. and he's strong. And clean monster means that you have no steroids, you know, you're clean monster, you're most oh, natural. Oh, clean monster. Oh, I like that. Okay, okay, I like that. Uh, and he's a heavyweight. Yes, yeah, heavyweight. He had three victories already on his record. Does he come yeah. to Ireland to train with you? He's going to come there after he, he get his visa and have his document right, uh, proper, you know, to he travel around, to he get out, to get in, rush him. He's on this process now. You know? He's 22 years old, bro. He's had a great career to front of him, you know, and I, I want to help him. And uh, in Ireland, you're training with John Cavanaugh, right? Yes. Will he be in your corner on Saturday? Yes, John Cavanaugh is going to be in my corner. Justin, one of my boxing coach, Dave Rhodes, another coach as well, and Michelle Pereira, my Brazilian. 
Wow. Right. And uh, is this the first time that Michelle is in your corner? Yeah, it's the first time. How did that happen? I, he lived here in Vegas. He's my friend, you know. I met him at, almost two years ago, and we became really good friends. And we did some training together. He's a really cool guy. And I came here, you know, and he's here. It's just met the time, you know, and he's going to be my corner. Wow. Help me just. Who's the better uh, dancer, you or him, in your opinion? He was, uh, I think I, I, I move a little bit better, but it is crazy. You know? <laughs> he is crazy. <laughs> he is crazy. Um, ultimately, why did you choose SBG to settle down? Why that gym, that country, that city? Why there? Because John Carpenter is a really good coach. He's very settled. You know? He's very smart. And I, the experience that I have with him, it's just amazing. You know? he, th he don't teach you bullshit. He th thinks that's going to work. You know? And he is very serious, man. He, he committed to you. you know? He introduced me like other coaches, like boxing coach, wrestling coach. He don't want to do everything. He, he put the proper guys to help. You know? He introduced me a good nutritionist, good strength conditioning coach. He put people in my life to to to, to make me better, and he want to make a, a, another champion. So, it's I'm glad to meet him. I'm happy to to be with him because he's committed to 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 the fights again. You know, he he's a really great coach, and I'm happy. Your last fight was in September of last year, 2020. You had that great win over Ryan Spann. Why has it been, you know, more than a year, almost 13 months since your last fight? It's I was training for another fight against Jim Crook, then I tore my back, so I have to stop a little bit to recover and re 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 like do everything again, you know, and settle a little bit down, but I come back stronger. I learn about my body, what I have to do to not get injury, injury prevent and everything, because that time I've, I've been doing everything properly now, so it's the first time I'm going to fight injury free and in really good shape and good place of mind, so this time that I have to take off, it makes so much difference for me because I'm a different fighter and I'm a different human being. I'm a different walker. Wow. That is, Best. yes. I, how, how painful was that to tear your pec? Bro, I was doing bench press, right? Without oh. technique, without coaching myself, just crazy on the gym, you know? And I was leaping to a couple hundred kilos and oh, oh no. my hand broke from my bone. Okay. My muscle was too strong. My tendon wasn't strong enough to hold on my bone, you know, and just pop out. And I have to make a surgery right there. Oh, my gosh. Oh, you have to have surgery? Yes. Oh, my. Um, that win for you snapped a two-fight losing streak. And it seemed like after the second loss, people were like, all right, this guy, he's done. He was a flash in the pan. We got all excited. Was that hard for you to hear people talk about you like that, to say that you were not going to live up to the expectations that we had? Not really. I don't really care. It was good to I realize, like, I, I get the, the, the critical as a constituent critical, right? People say things, then you just have to realize why they say this. They really true. Why this happened? What I have to change to become better, to become more. So I take everything that, that people say to, to, to improve myself, to see if we, will, will this happen? What I have to do to change? So I just stop and realize what I have to do, you know, to get better. And I stop and realize and I get better and it's working. And that's what you're referring to when you're talking about the diet and the schedule and everything like that. I'm living like a champion now. I live like a champion, literally. I just eat, train, sleep, repeat every day, focus. I get to the gym like half an hour early just to do my muscle activate, my injury prevent, you know. Then I go and warm me up every day. Very, very committed to um, when you look at the light heavyweight division and you see, you know, at the top, you have two older guys, right? Jan Bachovic, Glover Teixeira, they're fighting for the belt next month. You're relatively young. You're still in your 20s. You're 29 years old. How far away do you think you are from being in that discussion? Yeah, after this fight, I hope I can get the top two guys, maybe Jiri Prohaska. Then, because Chagas is going to be a really good test for me. You're gonna show that I'm ready or not for the top five guys. If I'm ready, boom, Jiri Prohaska. Then, depend of my performance after my next fight, I can talk about title shot or something, or maybe one more. Mm -hmm. So I don't really care. I come here to smash all of these guys and show that I'm here to be a champion, my friend. I love it. Uh, by the way, I love the hair. What inspired Thank this? You. 
I don't know, bro. Just wake up and boom. Happen. Who did it for you? My girlfriend. My fiance. <laughs> oh, you got you got engaged now. Yeah, I proposed uh, two weeks ago, I think, yeah. Wow, congratulations. When's the wedding? Thank you. We're gonna plan everything. like I proposed her on the mid the, 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 the on the middle of the countdown UFC. It was there, the guy was there, no? Then we finished the interview, I proposed her, then we we should celebrate, but we come back home, she make my diet and we didn't have dinner, nothing yet. We're gonna celebrate. We have a lot of celebrate after this fight. Wow. Did they film it? Yes. Oh wow, that is great. I love that. Um, is that out there yet? I haven't seen that anywhere. No, no I don't have it yet, but uh, I can't wait to see. Yeah, that is that is very smart on your part. Um, and so okay, so we we have this big fight, and it's you versus Thiago Santos. And I have heard in the past some Brazilians don't like to fight other Brazilians. How do you feel about that? It's true because you know you're gonna fight your same same patriot guy in your same place. I don't really see this as a enemy. I don't have enemy. I like to fight anyone, right? But when you see one against each other, this is not a war, you know? This is not a, how to say, yeah, it's not like a war, it's not against, it's just a, the sport, you know? And this is making me happy because I'm gonna fight another Brazilian guy. Like on, on my division, we have three Brazilians and this is so good. This just show how, how tough and good Brazilians are. Like almost every division you have a Brazilian. So this is making me just proud, and it's just business, you know. Okay. Um, what do you think of Jan? Are you impressed with him? Jan Blakovic? Yeah. Yeah. Depends the the performance that they're not gonna do against Thiago. I'm gonna beat the guy that beat the champ already, so it's yeah. gonna means a lot for me. Yeah. And Jan is he's tough, he's good, but you know, he's a champion, but I can beat him. 100%. It doesn't seem like you're too impressed with him. Uh, not really. He's not really skillful. He's strong. He's tough. I respect him. He's a champion, right? He beat a designer. Yeah. He get the belt. He's doing great, but I can do better. All right. I love it. By the way, I think I saw Michelle's ponytail there. Is that Michelle in the background? Michelle? I saw his hair. Is he in back of you no, over there? No, Who has a ponytail girlfriend. like that? It looked like him. Who has it? My girlfriend. That's your girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It looked like uh, looked like me because he has the ponytail, Michelle uh, Pajeda. Um, all right. So okay. So this is a big time fight, like you said. You can do it against. Uh, you could do a better performance. Who's that? Michelle arrived. Yeah. Come here, Michelle. Say hello. You see, I'm telling you, I saw him. We come to play some video games. He's crazy. He bring a big TV, PlayStation Five. Hey, hey my friend. How are you? Hello, Michelle. How are you, my friend? Good, good. You cut your hair? Yeah. No. Oh, there it is. Okay, there it is. <laughs> what video game are you guys playing? We're gonna play PS5, uh, Warzone, and just shoot and just relax, you no? Know? Okay, I like it. Um, he's thick, bro, six inch, and he's best. <laughs> to the hotel? He brings it to the hotel? <laughs> that is a serious gamer. Uh, how do you beat Tiago Santos, in your opinion? Bro, I'm ready to. I was on the hell on this computer train a couple of times in the week. Like many guys, bad work, blah, 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 intense, you know, like they really bring him to the hell. I hope Thiago bring him to the hell because I want to feel at home because hell was my home because I've been there many times. Wow. And I want to be on my, out of my comfort zone. If he bring me there, I'm going to be, thank you, my friend, because I'm ready for this because I need, bro, I train so hard and I'm really ready for this. So, I don't want to finish the fight so quick, you know. I hope I can show a really good show for the people who show my heart, my technique and everything. So I really want to fight. I hope we can do a really great show in the fight of the night. Maybe a fight of the year. I don't know. Well, Let's see. Wow. I never heard someone say that. You want them to bring you to hell so that you can feel comfortable. Yes, please. Jeez Louise, that is a scary thought, especially you saying it without even smiling. Very serious. You're, you're, you're. You're, you're saying you don't want a 15 second finish here. You want to go far. You want it to take you to a place where most people don't want to go, but where you feel most comfortable. Yes, my friend. Because, listen, I was on the house so many times. And imagine I go to the fight and all of the hard work, boom, done. Then I, what? 
I've been through this hell every fucking week, many times to this, you know, I want to fight, I want to feel, taste the blood in my mouth, I want to, you know, and mm, yes. I love it. By the way, uh, earlier on in your UFC career, we used to talk about you and John Jones a lot. What do you make of what's happened to John Jones lately? Um, it's, I feel a little bit sad for him, you know, and sorry. I think he needs help, you know, because he's, he looks like a cool guy. I don't know, I don't know his personal like mm -hmm. deep on his personal life, but he looks like he needs help, you know. And if he keep doing things like that, it's no good for the sport, no good for his image, you know. And probably he, he's in my dream fight. It's not gonna happen if you keep doing bullshit like that, you know. Right. A uh, very sad story, and I hope for him and his family that he can uh, fix things. Uh, Johnny, thank you so much. Good luck to you, my friend. Great to have you on the show. Your English has gotten a lot better, too. You've, uh, I guess, living in Ireland, it's improved a lot? As well. And I stood, I keep stood every day, bro. I stood every day. I do little lessons on, on my phone every day. Well done. You're a true pro, Johnny. I look forward to your fight on Saturday. Good luck to you. I can't wait to see this new Johnny Walker. Very serious. You're going to do something. And then afterwards, you're going to give us, what are you going to give us? A war? A uh, worm? What are you going to give us? Uh Surprise, motherfucker. Okay, all right, Johnny. Good luck to you, my friend. Thank you for the time. Yes, sir. There he is, Johnny Walker, fighting in the main event on Saturday against Tiago Santos. I like this new Johnny Walker. The hair, the vibe, the swear words. Remember, he had that great start. He wins the Dana White Contender Series in Brazil in April of 2018. Then he knocks out Khalil Roundtree. Then he TKOs Justin Ledet. Then he TKOs Misha Serkinov, and then he runs into the buzzsaw that is Corey Anderson in New York. Remember that? He lost in two minutes uh, to Corey Anderson. That was a big-time win for Corey Anderson. And then he met Nikita Krylov in uh, March of 2020. Actually, that was the, uh, the infamous pandemic card, the last one before the shutdown. And then he returned in September and fought Ryan Spann and uh, won that fight via KO, and uh, that was on the Woodley Covington card. So it's been a while. Since we last saw Johnny Walker, this is an important fight. I'm pretty sure, you know, he mentioned Yuri Prochaska. We had Anthony Smith on the show last week talking about how it seems like Yuri's going to fight for the belt. Also, no, Al Alexander uh, Rakic said that too. Right now, according to the UFC, Jan is obviously the champ. Glover is one. Yuri is two. Alexander's three, Anthony Smith is four, Santos is five, Dominic Reyes is six, interestingly enough, Magomed Ankalaev is seven, Volkan Ozdemir is eight, Krilov is nine, Johnny Walker is ten. So a big opportunity for Johnny Walker to uh, take a big step up in the rankings if he gets this victory on Saturday. Okay, so that's the story as far as Saturday is concerned. And uh, you know what? Let's save the questions for last since we're talking about the card on Saturday and we're talking about all these cards, Cage Warriors, Bellator, all this stuff. Uh, let's, uh, let's maybe go to our guy Connor, who we have dubbed uh, GC in honor of where he's from. Georgia Connor. We had him last week on the show uh, making some picks for UFC 266. He came back on Monday, told us that he killed it. He was very cocky about everything, just saying, like, man, I've already become the best, you know, gambling expert in the sport. I mean, it was quite the debut, if I'm being honest. It was Johnny Walker esque. I mean, he came out guns blazing, backed it up, and uh, made a lot of people money. And so let's keep this train rolling along and let's uh, go to the control room if we can. And uh, say hello to GC. How we doing, man? You're really, uh, really throwing us through a loop here, changing the plans. <laughs> well, I mean, is that a big loop? Uh, I mean, I just felt like... I mean, I'm sitting here relaxing. Yeah. You know. you know, I got to keep you on your toes. You know, I think it's better to keep the questions for the very end. It uh, gives me a little bit of a chance to... You know, how many... You've been in the media business for a while now. You, I mean, just, you know, top of mind. How many hosts do you think go three straight hours, no breaks book the guests, top guests, like A-plus guests, you know? How many do you think there are in the business? I mean, it's impressive. It's Scott Hansen esque I, I don't know how you yeah. go to the bathroom, uh, but Scott Hansen's not getting any guests. He's just watching football. Easy. I would say his gig is easier than mine. 
got to transition, ask questions. Got nothing in front of me. I mean, literally. He, go, he goes the seven hours, though. Yeah. Uh, by the way, he does go to the bathroom, in my opinion. He's never on camera, so they can literally go to one of those games, two minutes, he runs to the bathroom, he comes back. I call BS. I'm on camera the entire time, just for the record. I trust Scott Hansen. I'm, I'm not going to burn any bridges here. All right. Um, you know what I was thinking? GC. Yeah. DC. Helwani. I feel like the new name of this segment should be, dare I say, GC and Helwani. What do you think? Wow. I mean, I like it. It's a, it's a nice play on words. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, is DC going to come for me for this? I couldn't care less. First of all, DC's doing a show with some, you know, two bit jabron retired NFL player who no one's ever heard of. Wow. No, I mean, I mean, who's heard of that guy? What has he done? Super Bowl champion. Yeah. Man. What? what okay. Doing? What did he do in the Super Bowl? Like, really? What did he do? We claim Super. That's not like saying UFC champion where the guy actually wins it. What did he do in the Super Bowl? Can we pull that up? I mean, what did he get a tackle? I don't know. Like, I, don't, you know I don't even know who you're talking yeah, about. Exactly. <laughs> Well, anyway, I have uh, decided right here now that the new name of the segment, because we were throwing around names like betting with Burks and all this stuff, didn't really feel right. I went back, put the thinking cap on, GC and Helwani, here we go. We got some picks, right? We've got some picks, man. We got we got deep in the weeds this week. I got a Bellator play. Oh, my gosh, this is nuts. I got a Bellator parlay <laughs> as well. Then I got five single UFC plays. And we're going to do another UFC parlay as well. And and this time, I said, do whatever you want. I didn't give you... Like, last time I said I want a parlay for 266. Yeah. This is all you. Uh, I said, you know, Bellator would be fun. I didn't know if you'd go in the weeds or not. I guess we're about to find out. Without further ado, tell us what you have. Yeah, the Bellator ask it. It felt a little more demanding. <laughs> Get out of here. That's Bellator, not true. We'll bring out Bellator Burks here. That's what we'll call mm. him. Getting deep in the weeds. Uh, you know, it's a little afternoon delight for your Friday. You know, I like watch, it. Watch these on your lunch break. The prelims start at noon. We're in London, so it's early over there. Get the laptop out of work, stream it. Uh, so it's going to be a good day for uh, Bellator 267. Only got one single play. It's the only fight on the card that the favorite isn't juiced to minus 175 or more. Had him on the show earlier. It's the main event, the welterweights. I'm going to take Michael Venom Page, MVP at even odds over Douglas Lima. Uh, this play is already on the move. Douglas Lima opened at minus 185 favorite. He's now plunged at every book to minus 105. It's basically a coin flip at every at every single book. And I actually expect Page to maybe even close as a slight favorite. Uh, obviously, line movement doesn't always mean anything. Last week, we saw Cody Brundage against Nick Maximov. He opened at plus 275, crashed all the way down to even. He still lost the fight. So you're really looking through a keyhole if you're just looking at line movement. It's pretty worthless. However, in Lima's last fight... Uh, against Yaroslav Amosov. He opened at minus 200, bet all the way down to minus 110, and he did lose that fight. Again, might not mean anything, but it's interesting to see Douglas Lima in another fight with big line movement. Uh, let's get into the fight itself, though. I love that backstory stuff. I mean, that's the kind of insight that you wouldn't get anywhere else. That's why I feel like it's apropos that you have dubbed yourself the best gambling mind in the business already one weekend. I have not dubbed myself <laughs> that. We, we had a good Come week on. last week. Let's We're poke not even the bears. Give it Listen, gambling, it's a humbling game. Yeah. So we're going to stay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Because yeah. if you puff your chest out, you're going to lose. You the believe in the gods, man. They're always right. listening. Like They're karma. Like listening. DJ was saying, you don't want to talk about karma, you know, because it could come back. I get it. I get it. I understand. Listen, as hot as you get. Right. My grandmother always told me the next cold streak, it's always right around the corner. That's right. That's right. To the fight itself, though. Biggest concern, obviously, Paige. It's it's the level of opponents that he faces. You know, a lot of people says he can't. He's a can crusher. He just goes out there and fights cans. And you know, there is some validity to that. Um, he's never been smaller than a minus two fifty favorite outside of the Lima fights. And on multiple occasions, he he's at minus fifteen hundred, minus sixteen hundred, even as big as minus two thousand. Those are fights wow. that he basically is a lock to win those. While Lima, he's consistently fighting championship level opponents. He's been a champion himself. Uh, but I do believe, I went back and watched the first fight, I do believe that Page won the first round, obviously, before getting KO'd in the second round early. Uh, but he mentioned on the show earlier, he learned a lot from that fight. He knows exactly what he did wrong, and I think he will learn from that, from that last fight and use it in this one. Uh, something that's big, they're in London. This is a guy that feeds off the crowd. It's the main event. I think that will be a boost for him in this one. Lima, he's on a, his first two-fight losing streak since 2009. I think MVP makes it three here, so I'm going to go with MVP at even odds. Okay, I like it. All right. Bellator Burks. 
We're deep in this one. Okay, Mike. let's go. I mean, a lot of lopsided fights odd-wise in this one. Yeah. It, gives, it gives you the potential to get a, uh, a small plus money parlay going with, with some heavy favorites. But it's Bellator, man. It's a bunch of prospects, maybe not the most proven talent. So it can get a little risky. So we're going four legs with this one. Okay, parlay. Parlay. All right. Start with the Bantamweight. Kershed Kakarov and my, hey, hey, I knew you. I, listen, I decided with Mysterious Frank beforehand we were going to leave the out of it. I decided we were going to leave the. You, you say it properly. I tried to help you out. Well, first of all, like just to break the fourth wall here for a second, I said, you know, who, let's, let me know who you're thinking. And you tell me, <laughs> you say Kershed Kakarov, and I'm like, who is that? I've never even heard of this guy. Uh, Her, I think it's Kershed Kakarov. He is in the opener, the curtain jerker of the Bellator card on Friday. I give you props. I mean, you're watching this one eating, eating your yes. subway. It's at lunch. <laughs> this is, your boss is, is sweating over your shoulder while you got this one scre- streaming on the iPhone. Right. So we're really down in the weeds. It's uh, against Jair Jr., yep. not Jair Jones. You kept trying to tell me it was Jones. I, I said, no, it's Jair Jr. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, first fight of the day. Two guys making the Bellator debut. Kakarov is 7-0. and Six of those wins by finish. Junior hasn't fought in two years. While well, Kakarov, this will be his third fight in the last 12 months. He's been active, and he's been winning, and I think this is a fight that he's going to win. We'll move to leg two. Lightweight Jack Grant coming in at minus 500 over Nathan Jones. This is two guys struggling. Grant, he's 2-3 and three in his last five. However, all three of those losses were in Cage Warrior Championship fights against some recognizable names. Ian Gary, mm-hmm. you've had him on the show. Mm-hmm. He's making his UFC debut in November. Jair Bear, he's already made his UFC debut, albeit he lost. And then Aji Sardari, he is a Cage Fighting Championship as well, or a Cage Warriors champion as well. Jones, on the other hand, he's 2-5 and five in his last seven, much less capable talent. 13-10 and 10 overall, I think Grant gets back on track, so we'll back the Brit here in his hometown. Keep it moving. Leg three, light heavyweight Luke Trainer minus 450 over Yannick Bahati. It's an all-England matchup. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What, what's getting you? No, this is great. I love it. I mean, I wasn't expecting this so early. Here you are talking like a guy who's been watching the sport for 35 years. I love it. I mean, it's been 35 years. <laughs> you know you know these Bellator cards that people sleep on are the ones. I know. These are the ones, the yes. Are these the ones for like the hardcore gamblers, or are they? Are there such unknown fighters and the line so kind of wonky that a, a pro would stay away from this? I mean, these these are unknown guys. Yeah. Like you're getting deep on the tapology, yeah. the share dog pages. You're not you're not finding these on Wikipedia. Yeah, you know, most of them don't even have Wikipedia pages for God's sakes. Yeah, almost none of them. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I don't think any of them do except for except for like a Michael Page, yeah. and Douglas Lima. But Luke Trainer is a solid prospect. He's four and zero. All four wins by finish. Bahati, in his last five, he's one and four. All four losses coming by finish. Trainer, he's got the four-inch height advantage, five-inch reach advantage. So we're going to take Trainer to get a finish here. That prop's not available. So we'll just take him to win at minus 450, and he moves to 5-0 and oh in his young career. Let's finish off the Bellator parlay. I just want to say Luke Trainer, one of the nicest people. Like, I've never actually met him, but his nickname is The Gent, and he does a ton of things, um, charitable things for young kids. And also is like chisel. I mean, the guy is just I don't know, he has one percent body fat. I don't know, but just seems like an absolute gent of a human being. So I will say I like I like the pick there, just because it seems like yeah. There we guy. go. There you're you making go. you're making the pick easier for there me. You go. With that. All right, finish this off. Fourth leg, fifth ranked featherweight in in uh, Bellator. Leah McCourt coming in at minus five fifty. We'll take her over Jessica Borga McCourt. She's four and zero in Bellator. She actually handed. The Beast, mm-hmm. Fia Ray. We were on her last week before we unfortunately lost her. Her only professional loss. So she's she's fought some pretty big-name talent. Borg, on the other hand, she's 1-1 one one in the Bellator. Never beaten anyone over 500 or anyone with more than three wins. I think McCord gets it done. And hopefully, hopefully, because, you know, we cashed our UFC parlay. What what doesn't spell winner more than a UFC parlay than a Bellator, <laughs> Bellator parlay? parlay. Next. The early prelims, too. Oh, my gosh. But that would cash... Very small plus money at plus 111. Obviously, these are all big favorites. I can't wait for the PFL parlay later on uh, next month. That's going to be great. (laughs) Wow. Um, By the way, are you familiar with the actor Will Arnett? Wow. Yes. Yes, I am. And you will be 15th. Oh, really? 20th, 25th. Who knows how many people. uh, A lot of chatter on the uh, MMA Fighting Slack channel right now that you sound exactly (laughs) like Will Arnett. Yeah, well. How do you feel about that? I mean, I feel like that's a compliment. What a great. I mean, he doesn't he do voiceover work? Yeah. I mean, what does he do? Kit Kat right now? 
uh, I don't know what he does. Maybe a car. I think, I think he's the KitKat yeah. guy. Yeah. He, Arrested Development. Arrested. Uh, great podcast. You listen to these Smartless podcasts? No, that's his podcast. Him, uh, Jason Bateman, and um, Sean. Who is it? Sean Hayes. Sean Hayes. Who who said that? That's coming from Nick. Over wow, here. Nick getting Pretty involved. Cool, yes. Wow. Uh, tremendous. Po- Why is Nick a fan? Okay, wow. Uh, Nick sounds like he's like underwater or something over there, but, uh, you know, Mysterious Frank, I think, gives everyone a worse mic than him. He's got the top mic, but he wants everyone else to sound worse than him. No, I don't think that's a conspiracy. <laughs> Typical audio guy. Anyway, a uh, great podcast if you're looking for a good podcast. You do sound a lot like him. It's fun. I like it. I think he's Canadian, too. Is he Canadian? Yeah, Will Arnett is Canadian, I believe. He's not from Georgia. He's definitely not from Georgia. Yeah, but that's, uh, that is not the first time I've gotten Really? That, so. No, like I swear, yeah. Who said it? Mike Greenberg? <laughs> no. no. No, 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 Mike Greenberg doesn't even know my name. He doesn't. He has no idea. He definitely doesn't treat Yeah, Canadian. He doesn't treat you as well as we do here. 51 from Toronto. All right, on to the UFC. On to the UFC. Fight night. Santos versus Walker. Yes. We got five single players. No cage wearers, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't have that much time. Yeah, it's only right. one day between that's the shows. Right. That's true. That's true. I'm, I'm in the lab for the, I, hours on end over here. But this is actually another earlier card. Prelims start at four, main card I love at it. seven. We'll beat a bet early on Saturday. It's it's going to be a I good love night. It. All right, we'll start with the single plays. We'll start with the prelims. I will start with the lightweights. Jamie Malarkey, I will take him inside the distance at plus 250 over to De- Devontae Smith. Malarkey's an outright dog here, but I don't think this fight is even going to go to the go the distance, so why not take him to win inside the distance oh. instead of just you know the plus 130 of what he's going at right now. I know he lost his first two UFC fights, but being from Australia before UFC 260, which was supposed to be the OG Volk versus Ortega before getting canceled by COVID, Mm -hmm. he joined Alex Volkanovsky's camp before in a train. He then comes out of UFC 260, faces Kama Worthy, knocks him out in 46 seconds. Gives a lot of credit to what he did because of that camp. And now leading up into this one, we obviously saw Volk last week. He trained with Volkanovsky again leading up to this fight. He says everything's changed for him. He's going to come out even more improved than the last fight. He's going to have a higher IQ. I know, you know, words are just words before you get into the actual octagon, but, you know, the results are hard to argue. We saw Volkanovsky win his 20th straight fight, defend his belt, put on one of the greatest performances we've ever seen. And, you know, he's training with these guys. I know, obviously, he is not Volkanovsky, though. An interesting note, he fought Volkanovsky for the uh, AFC featherweight title in 2016. Look at this guy. I do think this camp has boosted his confidence. I think it's boosted his skills. We saw it in the Kama Worthy fight in a a little basic UFC math because this always translates perfectly. Malarkey knocks out Kama Worthy in the first round. Kama Worthy knocked out Devontae Smith in Uh the first round. It so flips, so Malarkey is a live dog here, so I'm going to take him to get it done inside the distance of plus 250. A lot of people say don't follow MMA math. You're saying actually follow it. No, that was more of a that was that was more of sarcasm. Oh, okay, all right. Sorry, I, missed I liked Malarkey anyway. Yeah, right. That was just a note that I <laughs> that is kind of crazy. Though. That is kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean it, it it is an interesting note. Um, but I mean I think this one's going to be a banger anyway. I think I think someone's going to end up getting knocked out. I'll get into that uh, a little bit later on. Okay, a little tease there. For all me. right, I like that's, it. That's, that's what we call in the, the radio business. Industry. Radio, TV could work in any kind of industry, but yes, media industry. All right, let's get to the flyweights. A women's bout, the Scott Australian. Yes. Fighting out of Australia via Scotland. I'm going to take Casey O'Neill inside the distance at plus 140 over Antonina Shevchenko. It's tough to go against Shevchenko after what we saw her sister do last week, cashing us a ticket. We don't want to go against the family. Mm-hmm. But they're obviously two very different fighters. O'Neill, she comes in, she's a good prospect, touting a 7 0 record at only 23 years old. Won her last three fights by finish. Meanwhile, Shevchenko. She's 36, obviously the older sister of Valentina. She's turning 37 next month. She's 9-3. and three. She's only had 12 fights over a career that spanned two decades back to 2002. And in her last five, she's just 2-3. and three. And she's coming off a second-round submission to Andrea Lee. Lee was coming into that fight on a three-fight win streak, and she had actually never finished anyone in the UFC before, so just not a good outing by Shevchenko there. So I like O'Neal not just to win. I think she wins inside the distance, so I'll take the plus money play at plus 140. I like that pick. A lot of people very high on Casey O'Neill training out of uh, Las Vegas these days, um, undefeated, as I believe you mentioned. Um, yeah, a lot of people think she could be a player in that weight class, so I like that pick. Shevchen- I mean, it's tough for Shevchenko. She's living in the shadows of her sister. Her sister's an all-time great, um, and she's older. I don't know if she'll 
realize that potential very hard for anyone to realize the potential that uh, Valentina has and it feels like Valentina is getting better. So yes, I, uh, I think that's a good call. Yeah, I mean, obviously when Valentina's in, in her corner, it always makes you a little bit more nervous, yes. but I still like Casey O'Neill here inside the distance. We'll keep it rolling on the prelims. Lightweights, Joe Selecki, minus 130, taking him over Jared Gordon. So Gordon has actually been a featherweight his entire career. Couldn't make weight in his last fight, so now he's just moved up to lightweight. I think back when he was in featherweight, he used his size advantage to kind of bully opponents. Now he faces a reach, a reach disadvantage, and he's fighting someone more his size. He's also 3-3 three and three in his last six fights. All of those losses coming by KO. Don't really have full confidence in his chin here. Meanwhile, Selecki, five-fight win streak for him. He started off 3-0 and in the UFC. So I'm actually going to take Selecki as a slight favorite here. Oh, okay. I like it. Interesting. All right. Uh, how how like Do you have a limit as to how many favorites you'd like to take, or does it matter? Because obviously there's more money to be made off the dogs, right? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously there's no value in losing. So if sure. you're just playing dogs, you know, it's it's going to come back to yeah. bite you, but you don't want to just play favorites in the UFC. Right, right, right. I mean, it's it's such a, a sport that anything could happen at any moment that, you know, underdogs are bound to win every single card. Do you think that the odds makers haven't quite figured out the UFC like they like they do? Like, I've heard this, that the sport is still so young, and maybe there isn't the the knowledge, the, the history, whatever, NFL, and it's a little bit tougher uh, to win big in, in UFC because things are so... Uh, volatile and unpredictable. Do you buy that, or do you think we've come to a point now where, you know, it's not as uh, loosey goosey? A few years ago, it felt like it was. Yeah, I don't know, man. The volatility in this, like, I mean, you, you see minus six hundred, minus five hundred yeah. favorites losing all the time right. in this sport. I mean, it, that happens across a lot of sports, though, too. Does I mean, it? I, un, underdogs win more than you think. They really? Do. You'll you'll learn that. You know, now you're taking unders in the in the Blue Jays game. Right. The more you bet, <laughs> the more you realize underdogs win. All the time. Okay. All right. And as I say that, I'm about to take another oh, favorite. Oh, damn. All right. I was getting excited. What do we got? We'll move to the main card. Okay. To welterweight. My man Nico Price going at minus 140 over Alex, Cowboy, Oliveira. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are two fighters that have really been struggling lately. Nico Price, he's 2 4 and 1 in his last seven. Oliveira, 2 and 5 in his last seven. Interesting difference, though. Oliveira opened as the favorite in all seven of those fights. Interesting. Closed, closed as a slight dog, and two of them lost both of them. On the other hand, Nico Price closed as the underdog in five of those seven fights, all four of his losses. He was an underdog, so Vegas was kind of actually expecting him to lose those, while Oliveira was expected to win them. But the biggest difference that I see in this, after looking at some statistics, is the volume that these two guys have been putting out lately. Oliveira's two wins during this 2-5 and five streak. Both of them came from decision. I just don't see him being able to get that done here. If you look at their last three fights that went three rounds, Oliveira against Peter Sabata, 45 significant strikes on 93 thrown. Against Max Griffin, just 40 significant strikes on 77 thrown. And against Nicholas Dalby, 18 significant strikes on a 15-minute fight on 47 thrown. Wow. Meanwhile, you go to Nico Price. He's going against Michael Pereira. 76 significant strikes on 180 thrown. Cowboy Cerrone, 150 significant strikes on 312 thrown. Against Vincente Luque, 129 significant strikes on 291 thrown. I mean, he's just, the volume yeah. is, is just, there's such a massive gap. You know Nico Price is going to go out here and throw in this one. And he was actually outstruck in two of those fights, the two that he lost. I just don't see that happening here. All of this, in addition to Nico Price's ability to knock you out at any moment, I'll take him as a slight favorite. Oh, this one. okay, all right. Minus one forty, I'll take Nico Price. That is going to be a crazy fight. Both guys. Oh, it will. Yes. No, for sure, it'll be a sweater, no doubt. Very reckless, and one of those fights that anyone can get knocked out at any time. Uh, so I look forward to that. What else? We, we going with Kevin Holland? That's what I'm getting into okay, right now. Okay. The final single play. The, the fifth people's and final main event. One. All right. Wow. We're not touch. We're not touching the main. Or is the main? Part of something. Else. Okay, we'll find out. Let's go with the uh, the Kevin Holland fight. Nice tease. Yeah, 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 nice tease. You're starting to pick up. Yeah, on yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah, it's the middleweights. I will be taking Kevin Holland at minus one forty five over Kyle Dawkins. Okay. I'm going against the Dawkins brother after yeah. after Chris treated me so well. I know well he last did. Week. He did. I'm just going against all the families that earned me money. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm that's sure this, right. Sure, this is going to work out well for me here. But uh, you know, we saw the unbelievable 2020 from Kevin Holland. Yep. He goes five and zero. Oh, three performances of the night. Ties the most calendar wins in the UFC history. Now we enter 2021. He faces Derek Brunson, loses by unanimous decision. 
faces Marvin Vittori, loses by unanimous decision. But both of those guys are currently in the top five. They're title contending middleweights. Uh, you know, look questionable on the wrestling, sure, but those are fights that he were he was underdogs in going into them. Now we enter Kyle Dawkins. He's much more similar to the guys that Holland was facing on that five fight win streak. You know, the the Suzes, the Stewarts, the Buckleys uh, that we saw in 2020. Something odd that that I think about this fight is is Dawkins enters the UFC at nine and zero. He drops two of his first three. Last time out against Phil Hawes, he does not look good at all, and he gets rewarded by facing Kevin Holland, his first ranked opponent mm. in the UFC. It, it, you know, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but like it almost feels like the UFC. You said it's the people's main event, mm -hmm. a, a very marketable guy in Kevin Holland, people that they like. It's it feels like they're setting him up for a win here. I could be totally off with that. You know, you can't obviously say for certain, um, but I like this matchup for Kevin Holland. The only thing that does concern me is Kyle Dawkins is a submission specialist. He's got eight of his ten wins by submission, and I mentioned Kevin Holland's takedown defense is not the greatest in the world. It's definitely one of his concerns. So I think if that's how it's going to get done for Dawkins, it'll be by submission. But I just think Holland, at this point, he outclasses Dawkins. He's just a step above him, and I think he gets the wind here. So I'll take him at minus 145. All right. I like that. Uh, an insinuation that maybe this is a, a tune-up fight or a gimme fight or a, a fight to get uh, Mr. Holland back on track. It would make sense. And I would argue that the UFC should do more of this um, because you've got a marketable guy who you can make money off of who's very popular who needs to get back on track. Sometimes they just keep throwing those guys in the deep end, and then all of a sudden we're staring at a 3-4, five-fight losing streak. This is the type of matchup that we should be seeing more of for a guy like Kevin Holland. Yeah, I mean, he faces Marvin Vittori. He obviously Short fought. notice, but fair enough, yeah. Yeah, yeah but he, he he fought for the belt, and, like, we, right. you know, that's that may be why he lost. Now, you know, Derek Brunson, if he beats Jan Jared Cannonier, yep. he might be fighting for the belt as well, whereas in 2020, he, you know, he's fighting... A lower level, you know... 30s, guys yeah. guys who would be ranked in the 30s, 40s, right. and, and Kyle Dawkins is, you know, top 50, top 40 type guy. I just think it's a very similar level opponent, and I, I think he's going to benefit from it. All right, I look forward to that. All right, now we got the parlay. Oh yeah, how many uh, how many bets total here? So we got parlay, two parlays, so that's two bets, yeah. and then six single plays, eight eight plays. So, oh, so there's only three in Bellator. No, nah. no, okay, no. Nah. Oh, right. So like, if you're counting each yeah. leg of the parlay as an individual play, oh man, and then we got eight, six, fourteen. Jeez, that's a lot. But I'm, but I'm only taking the, the parlay of you as one, one single. Okay, fair enough. All right. What do we got? All right, let's start in the prelims. Let's go okay. back to that Devontae Smith-Jamie Malarkey fight. I'm going to take this one. Fight does not go the distance at minus 200. It's very similar, and statistically speaking, as, the, as that uh, Medich-Turner fight we saw last week that didn't even make it out of the first round. Devontae Smith, 13 fights, all finish inside the distance. Jamie Malarkey, 17 fights. 14 of those do not go the distance. So these guys got thir 30 Combined pro fights, 27 have knocked on the distance. I'm getting it at minus 200. I'll take those odds all day to throw in a parlay. All right. All right. I like it. Let's move to the Bantamweight. Carol Hosa, mm -hmm. minus 385, mm -hmm. over Betch Cohea. Yes, yes, yes. Right Retirement there. fight. You better go with Betch. I'm not going. Oh, I'm, going with come on. I'm going with Hosa at minus 385. Come on. I mean, you just said it. It's a retirement fight. It's two fighters yeah. going in. The complete opposite direction. Also on a five-fight win streak, 3-0 and to start a career in the UFC. Meanwhile, it's Cohez. It's her retirement yes. fight. She's got two wins since 2014, 2-5-1 in her last eight. I think Co I think Hosa continues to ascend. Well, unfortunately, Cohea finishes her career with a loss. Uh, that's a bummer. I hate to say it. Yeah, it would have been nice. I mean, had the Ronda Rousey fight, she had the role. You could also be wrong. You could be wrong. That's true. That's true. Wrong. It just kind That's... of comes beyond. I mean, you're on a roll. Maybe it's a sign of things to come. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm rooting. I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy in Bristol rooting against your pick with no actual investment, but, you know. All right, we'll we'll check your timeline yeah. when yeah, that's Cohea right. gets that's the right. one. Right. <laughs> and you're applauding her and, and cheering for my downfall. All right, two legs left in this one. Let's go to the main card. Lightweight's. Alexander Hernandez, minus 500 over Mike Breeden. Mm -hmm. Not to be confused. Yeah, not right, to be confused right. with Mike Brink. Yeah. I'm sure that's, that's <laughs> the forefront thing on everybody's right, mind here, confusing right. Mike Breeden with Mike Breen. Uh, 
I just don't really think Breeden has has it at this level in the UFC. We saw him last year on Dana White's Contender Series. He was handed a loss. Hernandez, obviously not the most impressive, but he does have that experience in the UFC. He's got four wins under his belt. I just think he's the better fighter, and I think he's going to win this one in a fight that he should win. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the third leg. Let's finish it off. The fourth and final leg. No better way to do it than in the main event. we got the light heavyweights. Thiago Santos versus Whoa. Johnny Walker. What is the line here? The line's very close. Okay. Santos is a is a small favorite, I think, at minus one forty. But I'm actually, you know, I'm ta I'm taking the chicken parlay. Fight does not go the distance. Ah, uh, is that a real thing, chicken parlay? No, no, no. I'm just okay. saying, I'm, I'm scared to take the the close odds. You know, everyone everyone kind of heckles the guy who takes the big favorites on the parlay. Right, right, but, right. You know, that usually leads to more parlays than cash. But uh, yeah, I'm taking this one fight doesn't go the distance at minus four hundred. Five of Johnny Walker's six UFC fights have been finished in the sixth round. Eleven of his four of his last fourteen professional fights ended in the first round. I mean, dude does not like to hang out in the octagon. Mm -hmm. Twenty five twenty one of twenty three professional fights have not gone the distance. On the flip side, you got Thiago Santos, twenty one UFC fights for Santos, sixteen of them did not go the distance. 25 minutes is going to be a five-rounder since the main event. I think it's just way too long for these guys to stay standing. Two kind of chinny dudes, so I think it doesn't go the distance. I'll add it. Fourth and final leg at minus 400. Four legs, that would cash us out at plus 183. You know, I have to say, I'm not uh, one to sort of buy the hype, you know, be a prisoner of the moment, but Walker, I mean, I don't know. I feel like you need to read, uh, like the guy said, he hopes he takes him to the depths of hell so that he could feel comfortable. Sounds like a guy who's I mean, on the verge of winning. I mean, that's a great line right there. I mean, it's a fantastic line. But as I mentioned earlier in this piece, you know, talk is talk until the, until yeah. the octagon. All right. But it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe he'll just finish him and, and, and cash the parlay for us. Now, you did a great job on uh, on your Twitter. That's uh, at Connor Burks. There it is there. I mean, maybe we could talk about changing it to GC. You know, you, we could work on that. It's probably taken at this juncture. But you did a great job of putting, like, a graphic prior to 266. It was nice, neat. I mean, uh, I'm sure Jedi – I haven't looked at Jedi. I'm sure he's tweeted it all already for us, uh, unofficial member of the squad. But uh, I feel like now with all these things, like it would be a nice little bow for the segment if we had something to just, uh, you know, look at that, you know, TV 101, full screen. What do you think? Oh, yeah. We, the team's already on it. Oh, we're working on that? Do we yeah. have it? No, Let's we don't. Let's throw know. to it. Okay. No, no we don't. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean. Uh, wow. Now you're just really making us look. No, like I just, you said the team's already on it. Listen, we're, we're on it. We're in the process okay. of developing the graphic. The look, the feel, all that stuff. All right. Well, I look forward uh, on Monday. I, I was going to say, like, as usual, on Monday, we'll check in and see how you did. We've only done it once, uh, so I can't really say as usual, but this will be a thing. And uh, stay tuned. I think there's going to be more of this on the program. I hope everyone's enjoying it. They seem to have last time, so uh, let's see how you do. All right. Sounds good to me. Good luck. Let's go on Monday. There he is, GC, oh, GC and Helwani. Great stuff, as always, from our man, uh, Georgia Connor. And so without further ado, one segment left everyone's favorite segment and maybe this you know gc and hawani <clears throat> is going to become everyone's favorite segment but uh, as of right now it does appear as though everyone's favorite segment of the week here on heel wednesdays because this is when we uh you know we really get down and dirty with all of you it's time for on the nose with me ariel hawani and so that means we need our theme song frank you can hit it baby it's time for a good old-fashioned Q&A, MMA fans. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment has arrived to hear from the man himself, Ariel Helwani. Live from the Vox Studios in beautiful New York City, it's On The Nose. And now, to answer your questions, get out of your seats and on your feet because here he is, Ariel Helwani. Okay, I really screwed up something over there. Let me just make sure everything's okay. <laughs> just a little, it was nothing. No, it was pretty good. I knocked over my water that didn't have a cap because the cap fell on the ground. I didn't want to put it back on because I didn't want to put it where my mouth was. But luckily, uh, you know, cat-like reflexes, everything's dry. Don't tell Miles or Frank. Nothing's happened. I guess it was so quick. I mean, this is one of the all-time great saves. Nothing happened. I thought it was actually disastrous. I'm just going to put it over here just for safety. 
Um, all right. Thank you very much to Mike Heck for that theme song. And without further ado, can I just say one quick thing about the questions? Some of the questions here are McGillas. I can't sit here and read this whole thing. And we have more than ever. And I don't know if I'm going to get to all of them. We have 61 right now. Um, can, can I just ask to keep the questions a little tighter? I understand, you know, it's nice to look at, but if we can maybe bold the question, I don't know. Uh, just a thought. Anyway, here we go. This is from Dan. Uh, I'm way more interested in a Volkanovsky McKee matchup than I am in a third hallway fight. I know it's impossible, but it's fun to think about. Absolutely. I just don't really talk about it because it's impossible. Um, I don't think, whoops, I don't think Yair, I'm really going to get killed after this. I don't think Yair versus Max makes any sense. I said this, unless they're going with Henry Cejudo, which it doesn't seem like they are. And Henry, Henry, give me a call, Henry. Give me a call. You're ruining everything. Everything that we built over the last few years, with all due respect, Henry, you're ruining it. The gimmick is off. You're actually, like, before it was funny to call yourself cringe. Now it's actually, it's like bad, Henry. I can help you out. Give me a call. We'll figure this out. We'll get you back on track. We made magic together. I never steered. Remember the Bellas? You had the Bellas talking about you, Henry. Now what are you doing? You're ruining everything. You want this title fight? You give me a call. I'll make it happen for you. McKee would be great. And I think that fight would be very entertaining and very competitive. Uh, Volkanovsky doesn't think so. I'd love to see it, but there's like, what's the point? What's the point of talking about it? It's not going to happen anytime soon. McKee's in Bellator. They should do McKee versus Pipple and Volkanovsky versus Holloway. Holloway's fighting in two months. What's, what's Volkanovsky going to do? He's going to wait? Silly. All right. Um, Ariel, this is from Zach. At this point, I'm guessing you have seen Dana's rant last night after the Contender Series. I have. I was just curious what your thoughts were about his opinion on Nick Diaz. He said he thought Nick looked great for being off for six years. You know, look, I don't think he looked horrible. I guess it depends on what your expectations were. He said he had low expectations. In fact, I think he even said he thought Robbie would steamroll through him. Um, I personally think if that fight happens on any other show, under any other umbrella, Dana's blasting it for putting him in there, for how he looks. That's my opinion. I don't think saying that he looked great is a fair assessment of the fight. Also, this is really a thought instead of a question, but I think it's a shame how little people are talking about the real victims in the John Jones case. I see lots of people saying how they feel for John, but very little people focusing on his family. And he goes on to talk more about this. Uh, couldn't agree more. John is not the victim here. And that's why that Instagram story really rubbed me the wrong way. Best thing to ever happen to me. Well, let's ask the victims. And then you read in the police report, allegedly, his daughter is there. Again, allegedly saying, call the cops to the hotel employee. This is heartbreaking stuff. And then it's back to Instagram and working out and... You know, it's about me, 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 and my demons and alcohol. Like, again, this is all very personal. This isn't a fight. This isn't, you know, that's why I don't want to get into the whole strip him. Like, there's bigger things. Not strip him. Fire him before it was stripping him. That was always the thing. Fire him, release him. You think the UFC is going to release him so he could go to Bellator or Triller or someone like that? It's not going to happen. This is a business. But this is incredibly sad. And it's only getting worse. Remember, beginning of the pandemic, he's out, running with the law. First time out, running with the law. Uh, in Vegas, who knows what else has been going on. It's just sad. It's sad at this point. And uh, let's not, you're 100% right, Zach. He's not the victim. I see people posting pictures, this and that. He's not the victim here. This is all self-inflicted. No one did this to him. Had it all, could still have it all, is still young enough. And then every time it's like, like, where's the, where's the, where's, you know, like, where, where's the, the sincerity? Where's the, yeah, I don't know. The whole thing's a bummer. Uh, David, any word on when Tony Ferguson will step back inside the octagon? Who do you think makes sense for him next? Uh, I had heard rumblings that maybe they wanted him versus Islam. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, you know, I think Tony versus Connor when Connor comes back would make a lot of sense, but that's down the line. So we'll see. He's still a name. I still, I still think there's interest in him and 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 a market for him. 
I don't know if that Islam fight would go well for him, to be honest. Great backstory with Habib and Islam, but that wouldn't be the fight that I would pick for him if he wants to come back and get back on track. Ariel, with such high demand surrounding the BMF title, who do you think should be the next BMF title challenger? Is there a demand? I don't care. Oh, Newman replies uh, on the page, there is zero demand for another BMF fight. Correct. There is zero demand. It was a nice little thing, and that's that. And I personally think that it was uh, ruined uh, once they made it into an actual title. It was better when it was a figment of Nathan's imagination. Mysterious Frank, is this you leaving a comment, a question on my page? Yeah. Wow, this is big. Uh, this is the question that Mr. And you know what? I didn't even tell him to do this. It was short. It was concise. Well done. What NBA team jersey would you prefer to have Hilwani embroidered with? Now, let me ask a follow-up. Do you mean like the little patch that they have on the side? The name on the back. Oh, are you? would you want to gift me a present? I was just curious what team you Wow. Uh... Well, you're new to the team. Everyone knows that I'm a diehard Knicks fan. That's the team I rock with. In fact, my good friend Drizzy Drake... The Six God, Champagne Poppy, just came out with an OVO Knicks line. Some are saying it's in honor of me. You know, he's an Instagram follower. We DM. No big deal. But yes, Knicks fan since 1990. Orange and blue till I die. And I have to say, looking very good. I mean, GC's Hawks are a mess. I mean, they seem totally out of whack. The whole team, the franchise seems upside down. Um, Trey Young seems to be buying his own hype. The Knicks are on the straight and narrow. I love it. Uh, anyway, let's go to uh, Lewis Gilmore, my good friend. This isn't a question, but sharing an interesting observation I made from Nick Diaz's choice of walkout theme at 266. Nick walked out to Ceremony by Deftones. Now he writes the lyrics. Um, the opening verse, how can't you see this is the end? Let's face the truth. It's obvious, a different morning, the same charade. Tell me what's left, the chorus. So I'm leaving you tonight. It's not fun here anymore. I'll be joining the parade of the ghosts who came before. Wow, how about that? Very deep. Diaz Brothers' communication is often subtle on the surface, but there's a lot of meaning to be found in nonverbal. I agree. I may be reading too much, but with everything that came out pre and post fight, it felt ominous. I really wish last week's guest didn't pull out. I, I think you mean Mondays, Caesar Gracie. And boy, did I hear from a lot of people after that. And boy, are there are a lot of people talking about what happened in this camp. And in particular, saying, hey, look at the shape that he was in several months ago. Look at the shape that he was in in that fight. There seems to be a lot more to this story and to the buildup and to the comments that he made that at this time I can't really get into. But this seems like a story that is going to have some legs and is unraveling and uh, and is just a potential mess of a situation. And so, yes, I, I agree. I wish he came on to answer some questions as well. Not that I was going to hit him with, you know, some unfair stuff, but like who else is answering any of these questions? This week's episode of Where the Hell Is He? Hey, Ariel Hawani, where the hell is Gunnar Nelson? That's a good question. I will find out. I'm going to ask his dad, Holly. Um, I don't know. I don't know where Gunnar is. Pedro, uh, during your interview with Michael Chandler, you mentioned how it is how it is your understanding that the UFC athletes would receive an exemption from having to be vaccinated. In recent days, we've heard news from the NBA that says unvaccinated players in cities like New York and San Francisco will not be getting an exemption and will not be allowed to play. Is it different for the UFC athletes, or do you think this is something that will change for them as well for this upcoming MSG card? My understanding is this is more of an NBA thing and that as of right now, there is no concern regarding the MSG card. I would love to know the percentage. Like We're starting to find out 85% vaccinated in the NBA. Uh, I think I saw a high number in the NHL, maybe in the 90s. I would love to know if we're even at 50 in the UFC, to be honest. And that's not me you know, providing any commentary. I just know from my conversations, my limited conversations, where I'm comfortable enough talking to people about this, a lot of them aren't, and that's their choice. So I, I, I would... I would love to know if it's 50, just for, out of my own curiosity, is it even 50%? I don't know if they can go to places like New York if it's uh, if there's a rule that it has to be 100%. Simon, hey, Ariel, with your role at BT, will you be a part of the coverage for Fury versus Wilder 3? Not sure yet. Looking unlikely. Um, also, would you rather fight 10 duck-sized Francis Ngannou's or one 
Francis and Ganu sized duck? That's a good question. I'll go with 10 duck sized. I feel like I could run away and do my thing. Um, hey, Ariel, currently the UFC champions from all over the world with Rose and Aljo being the only U.S. born champions. A few years ago, we had guys like Steve A. Jones, Woodley, Holloway, Dillashaw, DJ as U.S. born champions. 2021, we've had Ortega, Lewis, Masvidal, Chandler, and Stipe lose in title fights. Who do you see as the next great U.S.-born UFC champion? Ooh, that's a good question. Who do I see as the next great UFC-born, excuse me, next great U.S.-born UFC champion? Um, how about El Diamante? El Diamante? Dustin Poirier. I'll go with Dustin. Lewis writes Sanhagen. Yeah, I mean, he's probably next. Corey Sanhagen, you heard it here first. Uh, Patrick, a couple questions. Um, would you ever consider leaving journalism for a front office job in either the UFC or Bellator? No. I would never do that. They would have to pay me a gazillion dollars for that. And I still wouldn't do it. It's just not what I want to do. One day... I want to take a year sabbatical. If I'm being 100% honest with everyone, I want to take a year sabbatical. I want to go run a promotion, show everyone that I would be the best promoter in the history of combat sports, and then I'll come back to journalism. I just want to do it for a year, and then I'll come back. So if anyone wants to give me that opportunity for a year sabbatical, come back, we can talk. Um, <laughs> Harry, my question for you this week is in regards to Kevin Holland. Being that he went to train with DC down in Gilroy, are we going to see a completely new Holland? He hardly trained with DC in Gilroy. It was more um, Johnny Hendricks in Texas. But I do think we'll see a, a more well-rounded Kevin Holland. I know my boy Josh Mackey loves your show more than his own family. Could you give him a shout-out? Today's his birthday. He would go absolutely bonkers. Much love, Josh. Usually I'll charge you 100 bucks for this on my cameo, but for you and Rahman, much love. Happy birthday. Hope it's a great one. Ariel, when can we expect to see you back doing your old job of being on the ground at events, face-to-face -face interviews with the fighters asking questions at the press conference? They don't really do the face-to-face -face stuff anymore. Do you see anyone getting that? There's no media day like it was. Eh. It's not really... It's not really the same anymore, and I have enough to do now where I don't have to go anymore, and, and I'm lucky in that regard, so I don't know. I'm not just going to go just for the sake of going. Again, like I said recently on the Pat McAfee show, everyone wants to go to the events to tweet out the picture when they're sitting cage side on Saturday night and say, my office for the night, and that's that. What are you getting by being away for three, four days yeah, maybe you're getting time to drink at the hotel bar. Maybe you're getting time to hang out with friends, colleagues, media, PR people. I don't want to do that. And so if I'm going to leave my family, I'm going to go do something productive. Big interview, talk to people, do something that actually advances my career. Not just to sit in the back and ask a question to someone fighting on a fight night and then a question to this guy and then hang out at the weigh-ins and take some videos and then hang out at the fight and take a picture, probably from the nosebleeds, or maybe if I'm lucky, in the back off a monitor. Why? Like, what am I getting out of that? It was a great time, a great run. I'm not saying I'm never going to go back. I'm not saying I don't have interest in going back, but at, as of right now, the way I've positioned everything in my life, I feel really good about how my week plays out and the things that I'm doing. And I actually think that it would be a deterrent to what I'm doing for all of you if I'm spending three, four days doing that sort of thing. Special event, different kind of event, Paul Woodley, SummerSlam, this, that. Sign me up. Big time, sign me up. But to go, I used to think that 80% of success is just showing up. And I still think that. But part of that thinking led me to going to every event. I wanted to be at every card. I remember a friend of mine, a very good friend, a mentor, told me I was in St. Louis for a Strike Force card in 2010 or 11. And he's like, you shouldn't be going to all these cards. And I said, no, I have to be going to all these cards. This is what's going to separate me from everyone. Ten years later... I'm starting to believe what he's saying. And that's not me saying at all that I'm better than anyone, that I'm uh, bigger than anyone. I'm not. I just did it for a long time. And sometimes you want to change. You want something different. And so that's why I wanted this show twice a week. Change, right? Things evolve. Things change. Your priorities change. Home life change. 
what you want to do changes. I mean, like all these things change. So anyway. Um, and if I'm being a thousand percent honest with you guys, like truly, as I like to do here on Heal Wednesdays, I don't get treated very well when I go to these events. So why am I going to leave my family for three, four days to be treated like garbage, to be treated like I'm not wanted? I don't need extra treatment. I don't need special treatment. I don't need the carpet to be rolled out for me, but I'm treated like dirt. I'm literally treated like I have a disease at these events. People won't talk to me. People go out of their way to, you know, avoid me, to put me in the rat. Like, for what? So I could take that picture and say, this is my office for the night. No, I'm done with that. I'm not going to be treated like that. Is that ultimately the deciding factor? No, because I haven't been treated well for five years at these events. Nothing's changed. I was going to go to the Glendale card. Um, and then there was the end of my time at ESPN. The point is, nothing's changed. I just don't want to be treated like that anymore. So when you go down the line, don't want to leave the family, all these new jobs, this show on Wednesday. I used to leave on Wednesdays, all that stuff. Things have changed, and that's that. And everyone's happy. I love this. This is great. Wednesday show, love it. Anyway, uh, would you ever consider releasing a video of the making of a typical MMA hour show from the booking process to behind the scenes? Eh, I feel like it'd be pretty boring if you ask me. Maybe one day. Hey, super cool to see you have MVP on. My first time asking a question here was about your thoughts on him. Question today is, what are your thoughts on the UFC announcing the interim title fight between Piotr Jan and Corey Sanhagen? Where does this leave TJ? Good question. I think the big question is, where does this leave Aljo? Because I could see a scenario. Aljo doesn't get back to 100. Jan Sanhagen winner fights TJ. It was only yesterday that I was reminded that Lima MVP2 is on a Friday. Why is Bellator so underpromoted? I don't know. But they need to pick things up. They they are lacking buzz. They are lacking momentum. It is uh, It is troublesome. Maybe overseas it's going to be different, but they really need to start getting the word out better. Building these fighters, building these fights. It's a great fight. They need to do a better job of that. We haven't seen Joanna in almost two years now after one of the greatest fights in history. Any intel on where she is? She's talked about wanting to come back. I saw her at ATT recently. Uh, I suspect we'll see her in the next few months, but no serious intel. Thoughts on Henry Cejudo starting his own MMA show with the Schmo? Please refer to my comments earlier. How come MMA champions don't walk out with their belts? Great question. I really think they should. I really think they should. I like that when they walk out and they hold the belt up. I don't know. And by the way, I don't like when they say fight, like they were calling Woodley a five-time UFC champ. That to me makes it seem won the belt, lost the belt, won the belt, lost the belt. I know they count each defense as a time, but... I prefer it if it's just one time. Each They call Matt Hughes nine times. That to me seems a little weird. MMA novice from Atlanta back in your life. Wanting to know if Amanda Nunes versus Valentina Shevchenko interests you. Yes. Refer to my comments earlier in the show. Very excited. Ariel, I wanted to circle back to the WFL and topics of new fight promotions. Uh... Trying to find the question here. Shorter the better, guys. They should start with smaller rosters and less cards. I agree. They should find niche stuff, like 165-pound division. I agree. Go 165, 175, 185, 195. What does Zhang Wei Li do with a second loss to Rose? That's the problem with going back-to-back, -back, and we've seen it with other people. Cody, remember? Cody TJ. Who else did it happen with? Oh, Rose and uh, Joanna. Does she have a future at 125? Potentially. She's talked about it. Ariel, who was the Scottish UFC fighter who you had on the MMA hour ages ago and tells a long winded story about a rock sack and his car being hijacked with a great punchline at the end? Robert Whiteford. It wasn't Paul Craig. Did you ever find out who sent that message saying they finally got rid of you at ESPN? No. I did not. I don't really care. Lastly, whatever happened to that young media member you interviewed with a water bottle back at UFC 127 in 2011? Was it you? I don't know. 
can you get that ham and egg or McAfee on and go full heel Wani asking AEW related questions? Stay tuned. Um, any interaction with Dana slash Hunter? No, I've only talked to Hunter once. This was Hunter Campbell, um, chief counsel. When I reported, I tweeted one time that he was uh, joining the UFC. I got a text from him saying, wow, I've just been tweeted about, reported on by the great Ariel Hawani. Here's my number. If you ever want anything, hit me up. I thought that was awesome. I appreciated it very much. Uh, I've heard great things about him. I hit him up afterwards five, six times, even said I'd love to meet. Never heard a thing back. Haven't heard a thing. Who are the top five MMA fighters that you would like to interview? I feel like I've interviewed all of them. There's really no one else. More to come. Do you ever think we see John back in the octagon? I say yes. What are your feelings towards Cameo? I think it's pretty cool. I've done it. I started doing it in my hiatus, and I enjoy it. A couple times a week. Why not? Okay, just a couple others, uh, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, you gave some good advice to aspiring journalists the other week, my man. Would you have any advice for aspiring publicists? Yes, there's a lot of bad ones in this sport. Terrible ones. The best publicists, in my opinion, are the ones who came from media, the other side of the fence. There's a great one. I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning him. CJ Tuttle works for Bellator. Love this guy. Why? Because he used to be an MMA media member. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. But I think it benefits him greatly. So he knows what to pitch, how to pitch. Other people are like, do you want to talk to this guy? Why? Why do I want to talk to him? Tell me why. Give me a reason. Now, this question is coming from someone who I think I know who it is. There used to be a PR guy for the UFC, Ant Evans. He would give me a one-page pitch as to why I should have Mr. X. Sometimes I knew all about this person, but like, that's the effort that you need to, to go through and, and with to pitch people. Don't just be like, hi, would you like to talk to uh, Kyle Dawkins? Well, why? Give me a reason why. Is there something that happened to him recently? Is it just that he has a fight? Or is there a backstory? Is there something you want to sell us on? Those are the best PR people. There's a lot of lazy ones in this game. A lot of bad ones. If there's one thing that I've learned in this game, there's a lot of bad PR people. Lazy ones, too. There's some great ones. I named a couple. There's some, you know, I'm not going to name them all because I'm going to get in trouble again, but come on. Stop being so lazy. Um, I'd like to see a change in the opinion of the warrior mentality. I agree. I mean, you could still be a warrior like Brian Ortega and the fight could still stop going into the fifth. The fight should have been stopped, in my opinion, going into the fifth. He took too much damage. Does what happened over the weekend have any effect on when, who John Jones is booked to fight against next? Too soon to say. What's the situation with Henry Cejudo? Who the hell knows? All I know is that he's putting everything we worked on down the toilet. Now, of course, when I say we worked on, it's just him on. You know, you, there's, a, there's, there's a magic here in the interviews. I'm not trying to give myself the old Barry Horowitz, but we did some good things. The Bella Twins put him over, for God's sakes. You think the Bella Twins are going anywhere near this gimmick? Come on, Henry. You look like the nobody beats the whiz guy. Come on. What are you doing? Ruining everything. All right, just a couple more. Uh, what are your thoughts on one championship? Oh, their last event was good. It was a good event. You think Conor McGregor should fight again? Absolutely. What are your expectations this year about, about your Knicks? Love the Knicks. Think they're great. Love Kemba. Love Derrick Rose. Kemba's going to give everyone the y'all must have forgot. Evan Fournier is the man. Judica, hey, Evan, come on the show. We'd love to have you. Oh, this guy says that he used to play with my teammate Joe, and he says, I'm a great men's league teammate. I am the very best. AEW tonight, Brody Lee tribute show. Love that. Brody's the man. May he rest in peace. AEW's doing some great things with Owen Hart, uh, the Memorial Tournament. I love it. Okay, there's so many good ones here. I'm going to pick two more, and then we've gone way over. I, I mean, when I signed back, I said I'm going to go two hours. I'm approaching four, for goodness sakes. Uh, Ari, I love when you talk boxing. Thank you. That wasn't a question. It was too long. Give me a short one. Oh, my God. 
Look at this. Keith, I didn't even see this. I swear I didn't see this. Ariel, is it too soon to launch GC in Hawani? Could you believe that? Great new segment and Connor's killing it. It's probably Connor who wrote this. My question is, do you think with Eric Winter joining Probellum, their plan is to eventually launch a Fight Pass style platform? Very astute. I would say yes. Okay. Uh, last thing. Ariel, wondering what your favorite restaurant was from your visit to Cleveland. You know what? There was a coffee shop next to the hotel. This is going to be totally useless, but it was great. One thing I love to do when I go on the road is find a coffee shop in like a local one. I'll never go to Starbucks or any of that. Like, I don't like that. I want to see what's out there. I love coffee shops. One day when I'm rich, old, and famous, and hopefully no one cares about me anymore, not because I did something bad, but just because, you know, it's time to walk away. I want to own a Westphalia. I want a Westphalia, a Volkswagen old school, like 1970 Westphalia. And I want to own a coffee shop. And I want to drive my Westphalia to my coffee shop, sit outside, and tell people about my grand old days as an MMA journalist. And that's it. Kids will be grown up, married, great lives. Maybe my wife will be by my side. Maybe she'll be annoyed at me by that point. Who knows? I want my Westphalia with the curtains, orange, yellow, pink, green, something like that. Yell I think yellow. And then I want to own a nice coffee shop, sit out there, drink my cappuccino, go back home, and uh, it'll be happy days. Thank you to everyone who left us questions. The questions are great. Maybe I have to go back in there and write some. I mean, I see a ton of stuff here. I love it. I love the engagement. But alas, we are out of time because, look, I mean, we don't, you know, <laughs> we don't get paid by the hour here. It's time to go. No, I'm kidding. I could go six hours if I want, but, you know, it's time to go. Let's be honest. Uh, Mysterious Frank, you can hit my music. I'm sure most importantly, they want to go at this juncture. I mean, everyone's like, you know, we didn't sign up for this. This is crazy. I'd even get into the rant about De La Hoya. All I'll say about the rant about De La Hoya yesterday was, you're going to pull out a card like that with, with, you know, no-namers and compare it to UFC 266? One of the best cards of the year with big names, pound for pound greats. I mean, that's like comparing a contender series card to a Terrence Crawford card, to a Canelo card. And by the way, tell me what the purse, excuse me, tell me what the, the, the gate was for Bally's Fight Night 24 in some studio in California. What was the gate for that card? And what was the gate for 266? We're really going to compare this? Are you all going to get worked like this? Are you all going to sit there and be marks and get worked over like this? It's apples and oranges. It's it's freaking apples and pizza. It's not even close. I get, listen, Oscar's a clown. Oscar's got his own problems. But don't come out with your little press briefing, you know, purse for a card that no one heard of, that no one watched in person, that doesn't have a fighter with a notable record of any kind, a resume of any kind, and compared to UFC 266? Let's compare apples to apples here. And how much revenue was generated from 266 compared to that card? It's not even close. Break that down. Where's the press briefing there? Anyway, I'm out of time. Thanks to all our guests. Love you all. Back next week, same time and place. Until then, I say peace.